I'd like to bring this month's meeting of the Metro Historic Zoning Commission to order. Um, first of all, are there any council members here that would like to speak before we get started with the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve last month's meeting minutes? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, we have a public hearing for each case. There will be one. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they're representing an organization or a group, and they may have five minutes. We're about to start the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the items be removed from the consent agenda. Consent agenda? <laughs> The consent agenda includes 916 Boscobel Street, which is an application to uh, change the rear setback of a previously approved DADU. 1620 Ordway Place, new construction addition, 102 South 17th Street, new construction addition and setback determination. 3701 Richland Avenue, which is lot 14 of the Richland Hall development. That's um, an application for new construction infill and outfilling with a setback determination. 1426 Roberts Avenue, new construction outbuilding with a setback determination. 150 Windsor Drive, new construction of addition and a partial demolition. 28 to 210 Broadway, an application for signage. 1504 Sweetbriar, application for an addition and outbuilding with a setback determination. 1322 Sixth Avenue North, new construction outbuilding and appurtenances with exterior lighting. Is that being pulled from consent, Robin? Thir uh, 1322, okay. So, I'm sorry, so 1322 Sixth Avenue North is being pulled from consent, um, so that is not part of the consent agenda. 4503 Park Avenue is an application for demolition and new construction of addition and setback determination. 1010 Lawrence Avenue, new construction outbuilding. 1116 Ordway Place, new construction outbuilding, which is a DADU and a setback determination. And that completes the items on the consent agenda. Staff has found that all the items on the consent agenda meet their respective design guidelines. Okay, any questions for staff? Seeing none, open public hearing if there's anyone that wanted to speak regarding uh, taking of these off the consent agenda. Seeing none, close. Oh, do we have one? Okay. 3701 Okay, thank you. Any others? Okay, close public hearing. Motion to approve. So moved. All in favor? Uh -huh. All opposed? Okay. Um, the to the Sorry. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.6A.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via statutory writ of certiorari. You're advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to, to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. So I guess our first one is going to be um, 3701 Richland. Before that presentation, I, I just wanted to make clear in case there was anyone here waiting for it, but the Germantown design guidelines will be deferred till next month. I uh, apologize, I was not prepared and I don't have slides available for 3701 Richmond Avenue. You can see uh, the top image is a rendering of um, the front facade. So um, you can see that there. So uh, 3701 Richland Avenue is an application for new construction and infill and an outbuilding with a setback determination. This is lot 14 of the Richland Hall development. So I'll hold up some drawings. I'm not sure if that's helpful or not. Um, but <clears throat> most of the Richland Hall development is on the east side of Richland, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, I, I just thought I might get us back on track just in case anybody's waiting or confused. I believe after consent um, and the Germantown design guidelines were removed, we went into violations before okay. new business. And 119 Third Avenue South and 421 Broadway have been deferred until next month. So that would bring us to 423 Broadway. 
I will back. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, four twenty. I'm confused too. So which one are we starting with now? 423. If, if we stick with the agenda, um, right after consent, we had the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay okay. Design Guidelines, which has been deferred till next month. I got you. The next on the agenda were um, violations, and the first two have been deferred till next month. Um, is Paul here? Okay, I got you. Two. Sounds like just more or less because the item was moved from, even though it was on consent, it just falls in regular rotation with. I got you. That's what habit will do for you. Okay. Um, I apologize to the person who pulled it from consent, but we'll, that we start it. We'll start with 423 Broadway then. Okay. Good afternoon, 423 Broadway um, is in our violations section this afternoon. A rooftop addition was approved last year and was constructed as permitted. However, the business installed uh, some unpermitted features, metal poles fixed to the railings with string lighting attached. The guidelines for new construction require that additions be located at least 30 feet from the front of the building. Permanently installed features such as those uh, that have been uh, fixed uh, encroaching into this area do not meet uh, the guidelines. Section 2T specifically for lighting um, states that lighting should be simple and unobtrusive in design materials and relationship to other facade elements. String lighting and the supports for it do not meet the guidelines as they are easily visible and encroach into the, the aforementioned area. Also, unpermitted signage has been installed on the building's awning, as seen here. Uh, this building is allotted 46 square feet for signage. The approved projecting sign, uh, which you can see in the image uh, beyond there, is 44 square feet, which leaves two square feet uh, in their allotted area. Staff estimated the area on the awning at 28 square feet, so the building is um, an estimated 26 square feet over its allotment. The guidelines also limit the width of text and graphics on an awning sign to 75% of its width. The text on the uh, valance uh, here takes up approximately 90% of the overall width. Um, therefore, the awning signage does not meet the section uh, for awning signs either. In conclusion, staff finds that the installed features do not meet sections 3H for additions, section 2T for lighting, and section 4 for signage, and recommends their removal within 30 days of today. Okay, thanks, Paul. Are there any um, questions regarding this? Okay, thank you. Is the uh, applicant um, available, I'd like to come forward. I don't see anyone, sir. Okay. All right, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, seeing none, closed public hearing. <coughs> Discussion? Or motion? Mr. Chairman, this seems to be a pretty clear-cut violation of uh, clearly stated guidelines. I uh, recommend that we uh, um, agree with the staff recommendation and adopt this. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay. Now we'll go to 3701 Michelin Avenue. We had two pulled from consent, so if it's all right, we'll start with 420 North 16th Street. No, 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 uh, 1322 Sorry, 1322-6. I've got my agenda off target now. 
We normally, do you mind if I do 3701? It just, we've already done it twice. I normally take the first one off and make it the top. So let's just do 3701 if if you guys don't mind, unless you need more time to prepare. No, we're just gonna switch the AD quickly so I can have some visuals. We, at least we have it too. Uh, thank you for your patience. So, um, <laughs> good. How does this work? There we go. Uh, there you go. Oh, yeah, keep going. <laughs> oh, can I do this? Okay. Am I able to do it? Okay, so 3701 uh, Richland Avenue is lot 14 of the Richland Hall development. Um, just to refresh your memory, this is in the Richland West End Conservation Zoning Overlay. There's a total of, I believe, 22 lots uh, that will be redeveloped for single family houses. This is a former Welch College campus. Um, <clears throat> we've approved, uh, I believe, lots one through six and then also lot 11. So we've approved quite a few houses to date. Um, this lot is, what, is part of what you see as phase two, so it's on the corner of um, Richland Avenue and Craighead, um, right kind of where it says phase two. I'm not sure if you see the lot number there. Uh, here's the site plan, so it's a corner lot, and for corner lots, the base zoning is typically 10 feet from the um, street uh, side property line. Um, they are requesting, I believe, six feet, let me make sure it's six now, uh, from the side property line. Um, uh, sorry, give me a minute, sorry about the delay. Yeah, so I'm sorry, apologize for that. So it will be six feet from the Craighead side property line, but base zoning requires 10 feet. Uh, the same for the garage, um, the outbuilding, which is not a dadu, um, it is gonna be six feet from the side property line, whereas base zoning typically requires 10 on a corner lot. It meets all the other base zoning setbacks. Um, staff did find that the six foot side setback determination is appropriate. Um, we looked at the historic context, and I'll show some photos here, and let's see if I can go back to see the photos. Um, so the photo on the top is the house across the street at 3700 Richland Avenue, and it sits very close to the um, side property line as well. Uh, get the exact, um, it's definitely less than 10 feet and it's less than six feet as well. Uh, when I went out to measure it, it was four feet, nine inches for most of its depth, and then it was two feet from a bay. So it also sits closer than 10 feet. So staff found that because um, there are historic houses in the neighborhood, particularly one just across the street on the corner where the base zoning, where the setback was less than the base zoning 10 feet, that what is proposed as six feet was is appropriate. Um, just another thing to point out on the um, site plan is typically uh, we require at least 20 feet in between the infill and the outbuilding. They are requesting 12 feet. Um, staff finds this to be appropriate. We've actually approved as little as 10 feet for all the other houses because because of the um, because there's no alley behind here, so they're having to create a new alley at the back, which is kind of scrunching the uh, usable lot size. Uh, on the front setback, staff is recommending that the um, that the entire outbuilding be, or I'm sorry, the entire infill be pushed back two feet, and that's transition from this lot to the nearest historic house, which is at 3705 Richland Avenue. The applicant has agreed to um, to that condition. Uh, here are the um, floor plans, so the first floor plans, and the second floor plans. Uh, here are the front elevation and the left elevation. Um, and the, um, the maximum height will be 34 feet, six inches above the foundation, which is about one to two feet. Um, staff finds that the 
two-story form and the height is in keeping with historic contacts and also within what has already been previously approved for this development on Richland Avenue. Uh, here is the right elevation and the rear elevation. And here are the images for the outbuilding. Um, so, in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of the project with the following conditions. The front setback of the infill be pushed back two feet, um, so the front porch is 42 feet from the front property line, and the front wall is 50 feet from the front property line. Two, the finished floor height be consists of the finished floor heights of a neighboring historic houses. Three, staff approve a brick sample. Four, staff approve a stone sample. Five, staff approve the shingle and metal roof materials and colors. Six, staff approve the materials for the front for the porch floors and stairs. And finally, seven staff approve all windows and doors prior to purchase and installation. So with these conditions, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines for the Richland West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, thanks Melissa. Any comments to staff? A question, <clears throat> Melissa, on, and I know you're not a surveyor, nor did the property line when you did these me so, measurements across the street. It was the, um, your assumption about its proximity to the property line was kind of, was it back of curb, back of sidewalks? Back of, si sidewalks assumed back to of be sidewalk, because I, what I was doing was comparing basically apples to apples. So um, uh, here on this site plan they are showing, and I believe they have done a survey of this, they're showing the property line as the kind of interior side of the sidewalk line. So I made that same assumption for across the street. Good, great, thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Is the applicant here like to speak? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. So the applicant has nothing to add, but agrees with staff recommendations. All right, uh, open public hearing. Um, like to come forward, please state your name and address. Hello, my name is Wesley Weeks. I own the house at 3705 Richland Avenue, which is uh, just the property next door to this one, essentially. I've been asking for months to someone tell me what they were planning to build on the property, and no one has come forth with any plans. To, I've invited conversation about it. Um, and in fact, I wouldn't even know to be here today if my neighbor hadn't asked me about this, because I didn't get any notice about the hearing today or the applications or no signs posted. To my knowledge, the property has not even been subdivided into two lots. If it has, um, that got done without my knowledge as well. It has been. Um, my understanding from the planning department is that it's in the process of being subdivided, but I don't think it's been officially subdivided yet. I've got no notice of that. So I have questions about what they're doing more along the front setbacks how they're gonna address drainage onto my property, things like that. We probably, if, if they were just open up and have a conversation with me, we could probably work those things out pretty easily. Okay, all right, thank you. Sometimes I was wrong. just gonna say, since the applicant is here, maybe they could um, step into the hall and probably some of those questions could be answered. No. Okay, thanks Robin. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to speak regarding this project? Okay, close public hearing. Any more discussion or a motion? I think to speak to some of the concerns raised by um, the uh, adjacent property owner while um, this form, you know, in terms of dealing with stormwater uh, or water runoff from one property to the next, we, we not, not within our purview, so we really wouldn't have a chance to speak to that or even to uh, procedurally to the subdivision. And understanding that and the other um, adjacent properties that have been approved um, and reviewed by this commission, I would, um, it, it seems to me that um, the setback that the applicant has agreed to in the staff's recommendation would, would certainly make it appropriate in that it matches the adjacent home. Um, and the evidence pre presented here, the assumptions made here about a directly adjacent across the street property on the side setback would would deem this as, as an appropriate uh, and, and compliant with, with our guidelines. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? I didn't make that a motion. But oh, it was a, I thought it was a motion. <laughs> so I, I guess 
I understand all that. I'll, I'll move approval with the staff right now. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, sir. 1322 Sixth Avenue North. And just a reminder to turn your mics on, please. Thanks. back up one, okay. Uh, this is an application to construct a new outbuilding, uh, a planter box and sign and to install lighting. Uh, what's shown here is a recently constructed building infill uh, that was uh, just wrapping up complete or is completing now on the lot. The outbuilding will be behind this building uh, and it will be approximately 18 feet behind the back wall of the building. The outbuilding will be 570 square feet. Sean, can you speak just a little louder? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the outbuilding, as I said, will be 570 square feet. It will be behind the building, 18 feet behind the rear of the principal building. <clears throat> the planter box. Uh, will be in the center of a courtyard between the two buildings and the sign will be uh, built on top of that planter box. And the sign, or the lighting, excuse me, will be string lighting hung from the sign to the principal building and to the outbuilding. Uh, the outbuilding will be 10 feet deep, uh, that's it there and uh, 57 feet wide, matching the width of the building, the principal building. It will be nine feet tall at the front with the roof sloping down toward the rear and attaching to a wooden fence uh, that divides the courtyard from the parking lot. Uh, the posts and side walls of the outbuilding, uh, which is being referred to as a cabana, will be wood. Uh, the roof of the building will be canvas. Canvas is not a typical roofing material for outbuildings, but because of the location and the direction of the slope, it will not be visible from the street. The planter box uh, at the center of the courtyard uh, was actually part of the original approval with the building, the principal building, but at that time it was proposed as a fountain. Uh, it's essentially the same except with soil filled in instead of, wood, uh, instead of water now, uh, and there will be seating built uh, into the planter uh, around the center, uh, the planting box. Uh, the, the planter box will be wood, and on top of the planter box shown there is a sign. Uh, it's not really a uh, advertising sign because it's in the courtyard and advertises or displays the kind of the, the name of the space. Uh, it's more a placemaker or directional signage. Uh, but in any case, uh, because of the location of the planter in the courtyard obscured by the building, it would not be visible from the street. Uh, in fact, here are renderings from the applicant that look very much like the pictures I took, and you can see uh, the outbuilding there uh, where it would be shown, but the planter is, is towards the center of the building and would not be visible. Uh, they also are proposing string lighting, as I said, from the planter box uh, to the outbuilding and from the planter box to the principal building. The lighting is to be string lighting suspended across the courtyard uh, from the roofs to the sign. Um, here are examples of similar lighting in businesses in Germantown. Um, but I should note that we did not approve any of these. Uh, in fact, their presence has really just come to our attention now. Um, largely because we do inspections during the day, so lighting get, like, can be hard to come across. Uh, as I said, we did not approve those, uh, and I, the handout we passed around shows, um, it's just ex excerpts from the permits. Uh, for instance, we permitted an awning, um, and it says no lighting is to be attached, so obviously that was something that didn't specifically mentioned as not being approved. There are others where it just was not mentioned one way or the other. Um, 
staff found that the guidelines for illumination say exterior lighting fixtures shall be compatible in style, size, scale, and material with the character and structure of the neighborhood and illumination should avoid spilling onto adjacent structures, signs, or properties. Uh, staff felt that the proposed signage, uh, much like the signage, re or the, excuse me, the lighting discovered does not meet that guideline. Uh, and in visiting the site uh, to take pictures, um, we discovered this curb cut there in the front. The curb cut actually predated the building that's there now. But part of the proposal that was reviewed and approved in 2016, the plans show that this curb cut was to be eliminated and patched with brick to match the adjacent sidewalk. Uh, so staff would ask that that be done. Uh, and sort of to sum it all up, staff recommends approval of the outbuilding, planting box, and signage with conditions that the Bollard, uh, that Bollard lighting or another type of ground lighting is used rather than string lighting, and that's a new condition, that the curb cut is removed and the area is patched with brick to match the existing sidewalk as was approved in 2016. And with those conditions, staff finds that this pro proposal would meet the design guidelines for the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, thanks, Sean. Any questions for Sean? Thank you. Would the uh, applicant here and like to come forward and um, state your name and address? Just, just briefly, um, I'd like to remind the commission that um, the proposal is, is kind of limited to the four corners of the application that we have here today. Um, any previous permit that was issued and maybe not complied with uh, can't really be bootstrapped to um, today's proposal. There are means that we can um, take to address anything that wasn't done previously, but we can't, unless the, the curb cut or the things that weren't done previously um, is somehow related to the proposal today, then it can't be considered as a reason for denying the, the current proposal. It, does that specifically um, relate to the condition number two? Okay. D just remove yes. condition number two. Okay. <laughs> All right. So condition number two is withdrawn. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Erica Garrison, and I'm here representing the owners of 1322 6th Avenue North. We want to thank the uh, staff and the commission for working with us on this application. We ask that you accept the staff's recommendation and approve um, our outdoor furniture design with one note regarding the lighting. Nevertheless, before I address the lights, I want to briefly address the opposition from the neighborhood. You've received a letter from the Neighborhood Association, which I've received a copy of, and our response, um, which I believe is being handed out to you and you may have received earlier. I won't belabor our response, um, but I do want to highlight several quick important points for you. The association has stated not one single reason why the outdoor furniture or cabanas as they're referred to are uh, inconsistent with the guidelines and should be denied. Instead, the association has relied on other codes and permitting issues with which this commission has no jurisdiction over and therefore I don't want to address that in any other detail other than to say that my client is working with codes and will continue to work with them and is prepared to continue to work with the association and the council as we move forward with the project to make sure that it's in compliance with the zoning codes. <laughs> I would therefore urge you to disregard their arguments um, that, that they are not within your jurisdiction and inappropriate for this commission to consider. And instead, I would urge you to accept the staff's recommendation who we have closely worked with. You've also received a letter from Germantown Commons that primarily focuses on two things. One is use. The use of the seating area, uh, area in a courtyard is being inappropriate and inconsistent with the neighborhood and the prior decision to remove the cabanas from the design and the fact that, that, that once that decision was made, they should not be reintroduced. I'll, I want to take up the issue first with regards to use. The use of a courtyard seating area is appropriate and consistent with many other restaurants and uses in the district, such as Rolf and Darters, Fifth and Taylor, and Little Donkey. It's outdoor seating. That's it. And the commission staff has clearly opined in the re recommendation that a use is not something the commission reviews. What might be concerning, however, is the allegation that my client removed cabanas and then, then is reintroducing them. That's simply not the full story. My client did remove a much larger, more dense cabana design when the construction of the restaurant was, was originally permitted during that process. Those cabanas were much different than the design before you today. The design before you began as a temporary patio seating that you're seeing today, which was discussed with staff recently 
recently, and it transformed into this. In an effort to shield the light and noise that might be generated from that use from the neighborhood, Histor historic suggested the more permanent structure and the revisions to the, de to the design. Thus, they now support this design. This is being done this way and permitted, permitted this way in, in an effort to reduce the noise and light that would otherwise be emitted from the tables in the outdoor courtyard. It's not intended to become a nuisance to the neighbors. So in a very real sense, this is a much different proposal from the proposal presented before. As for the lights, my client would like to install those lights away from the public facade. It's behind a non-contributing building shielded from the street behind that building. The lights are relatively temporary and we would take the position that they are not affixed to a building should, and should not be appropriate for the commission to review as they're temporary and not a structure. Um, nevertheless, if you want to review them, um, we would like to emphasize the following points for your consideration. They're related to a non-contributing building. They're placed behind the building, away from the public, and they should not be obtrusive to the public or visible. The lights are low voltage and they should not pollute surrounding properties and they'll be blocked to a large degree by the landscaping and the seven foot tall fence. Finally, the lights are consistent with the look and feel of the district as evidenced from the photos, although those are apparently unpermitted. Um, and we would posit that the lights are consistent with section 5.4 of your guidelines. Um, they're shielded from the public view, they avoid spilling onto adjacent structures and they're compatible in style and material with the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Are you part of the owner as well? Uh, no, I'm Patrick Bales. I'm okay. an architect with MJM Architects. Okay. Uh, I was the architect for uh, the original renovations of the, the houses on that property, <coughs> as well as the new building that currently exists. Um, the record, you saved your name. Could you state your address as well? Uh, yes, it is uh, 712 4th Avenue South. Thank you. Um, I was asked to uh, work with Anderson Design Group uh, to put together a, a design for the uh, cabanas at the rear of the building. Uh, along the way, we were asked to, by the owner, to uh, have a space for the cabanas, and I've always provided power for the future cabanas. Uh, I don't recall any agreement to uh, not build the cabanas at some point in the future, I, or at least I was never told of an agreement. Um, we were, when we were negotiating with Sean, uh, we uh, proposed the idea of, of introducing a, a portable structure that could be, you know, simply put up and then taken down, uh, rearranged uh, if needed, and Sean actually uh, felt like something more permanent would be in order. So uh, the design of, of the, this canopied structure uh, was to minimize the impact of the activity in the courtyard on the surrounding area. Uh, the, the canopy rises from the fence at the rear up to nine feet on the inside, uh, as you can see in the, in the, uh, on the side elevation, and that helps to shield uh, any lighting and sound from the neighbors. So uh, uh, I also want to make one, just touch on one other thing uh, regarding the curb cut. Uh, we did intend to leave the curb cut uh, and a fence because we have a trolley inside the center building and that was to be able to remove that trolley, you know, if, if it needed to be removed at a later date. So regarding the curb cut, I'm not sure exactly uh, at what point along the line, you know, it may be that it needs to be bricked and we agreed to brick. Uh, that area, and I'll be glad to go back and look at exactly how that transpired. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. You guys um, can have two minutes for rebuttal after the um, public hearing. Um, open public hearing. Anyone like can speak um, in favor of this project? Would you please come forward and state your name and address? Okay. Seeing none, anyone like to speak uh, against this project? Please. Start, come up, start, say your name and address, come forward as well. Just cue yourself if you are.
Good afternoon, Commission members. Curtis Harrington, uh, attorney. And first of all, do I get five minutes <clears throat> or is it two? Are you representing a group? Or? I am representing a group. Uh, Curtis Harrington, a farm for sale White Laster, here on behalf of the Germantown Commons Homeowners Association. Okay. Yes. I just saw two there. Five so. minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, for the construction of the cabanas uh, based on a few central reasons. Um, the cabana structures have been a point of contention since the applicant's original submission of plans uh, containing the proposed creation of the cabanas in 2016. We would argue that the cabanas are not in compliance with the historic context of the neighborhood, would negatively impact the surrounding properties, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the owner has represented uh, directly and clearly to the neighbors and to this commission that cabanas, not lesser cabanas, but that cabanas in general were no longer a part of this development or the site plan. The cabanas, no matter how you slice it, and this is consistent with the design in front of you today, are outdoor party structures uh, to be equipped with spe speakers and a large square footage capacity for outdoor partying. During the commission's April 20, April 20th, 2016 meeting, it was decided by staff recommendation that since the site plan for the cabanas lacked sufficient detail, approval then would be would not be considered. Concerned neighbors appeared at, during the April 2016 meeting to voice their opposition of certain elements of the site plan, including the outdoor cabanas and use of garage doors on the on the primary property there, the trolley bar in the middle. The, com the commission voted to disapprove the application based on the fact that the project was not consistent with the historic context of the neighborhood. Next, during the commission's May 18, 2016 meeting, after a meeting with the neighbors, uh, through counsel and in support of the applicant's request for approval, the applicant stated that the applicant had met with the neighborhood since the last commission meeting. Uh, and that the project had been revised in the following ways. The first way was that instead of garage doors on the side facades of the trolley bar building, uh, the applicant had planned French doors. The second way was that the outdoor cabanas shown on the previous proposal were eliminated. Uh, again, this was after a meeting with the neighbors, hearing the neighbors' complaints, concerns, uh, and Richard Audette, who spoke during that May 2016 meeting rep representing the neighborhood, also spoke in reference to a meeting between the applicant and the neighborhood, <laughs> recounting for the commission the applicant's statement that the patio structure now behind the building will not be used for anything other than a few tables. That was the owner's representation to the neighborhood. Um, and now, some 15 months later, we see the applicant, again, seeking to reintroduce, reintroduce construction of the problematic cabana structures. Uh, and to address, it's convenient to try to argue that our issues here are, are use-oriented and not appropriate for this body. Um, and I understand that's convenient for the applicant. I vehemently disagree. I believe what we are arguing are, A, representations that were made to the neighborhood, and we have a public forum like this, and I know the neighborhood's concerns are taken into account under the scope of the structure of MCL 1740-410. Uh, I know this body does consider the effect of lighting sound, all of these different elements under the purview of the historic commission on the neighbors uh, of the association. So this is not a use issue. That's, that's a fight for a different forum, and we realize this. We're trying to be very surgical and argue uh, based upon the powers and duties of this commission uh, for opposition of these cabana structures um, and, and that this commission today make a ruling consistent with the representations, the prior representations, both to the public, the historic Germantown neighbors, and to this commission regarding these cabana structures. The representation was not, well, maybe we won't build a structure this large or this specific, we see this no different than the prior proposal for cabanas. They're cabanas, it's a large square footage for partying, their music, and to briefly address the rear wall design of the structure, um, the applicant's plans are using the fence, the only sound and light border between the Germantown Commons and the bar as the rear wall for these cabanas which will 
have large square, large square footage and contain speakers, uh, we believe that's inappropriate. By using this fence as a rear structural wall, loud music and other noise pollution will needlessly be directed towards the Germantown Commons. Thus, the applicant's design, if approved, would not be in the context of the historic Germantown neighborhood and would have substantial negative impact on the surrounding properties. Lastly, to exterior rope lighting, we defer to staff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Neighborhood Association. Um, the Historic Germantown Neighborhood Association. I'm sorry, state your name. And I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, Richard Ardette, 414 Van Buren Street. I'm president of the association. Okay. Is that different from the one he was representing? Yes. It is? Okay. My twin. Um, HGN is uneasy with the possibility that the Historic Zoning Commission could issue design approval when the proposed work may further break other metro agencies' rules and regulations. We point specifically to major code, uh, zoning code and parking capacity violations that appear to currently exist on this project. The addition of four drinking cabanas, the beer garden, will add a uh, more than 500 and square f 70 square feet to the total built footprint, significantly increase the number of patrons that can be accommodated, and add to parking woes in the neighborhood. It appears that the Germantown Bar's present parking capacity already falls short of metro requirements. We also note that the staff recommendations, in the staff recommendations, there was mention of an 18-foot um, distance between the rear of the building and the beginning of the cabanas. The cabanas are another 10 feet. If you stand on the street and you you know, obviously we didn't even request to, to venture onto the property. It doesn't really appear that there is a distance of 28 uh, feet in total to the fence. And I'd l we'd like that to be verified. The historic commission initially rejected the cabana design concept and it should do so again. If this construction is approved, it will further contribute to non-compliance with Metro's parking and planning regulations. HDN strongly opposes the beer garden proposal by the Germantown Bar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak regarding this project? Okay, would the applicant like to do a rebuttal? Likewise, state your name and address. To sure. Uh, Ward yeah. Pace, uh, 319 Linwood Boulevard, Nashville, 37205. I'm one of the property owners and have become one of the operators of the property. And I'm, I'm a little confused on the talk about meeting with the, with the neighborhood, specific meetings. I'm not aware of that actually occurred. And as I remember it and as I thought I heard the attorney say, the, we pulled or my understanding was the discussion about cabanas was pulled because it was conflicting and all that and we're going to be discussed later. It wasn't that we surrendered the right to ever do them, number one. Number two, we're not, our intention here wasn't to start building cabanas as much as to do an outdoor seating plan and to enjoy the space. I mean, the space is there, it's designed, it's out, we've got roll-up doors, all that is conducive with using the outdoor space. And in our I'm running short time, but with historic meeting with us, it was recommended to us that, hey, we ought to do it this way and apply to you guys instead of just designing and doing a portable structure, which apparently, and I'm, I don't mean this in a cocky sense at all, but apparently if we create portable furniture, we can put it wherever we want and however we want. We were told to apply this way in order to make it better for the neighborhood with the angle of the canvas uh, awning top to capture sound and light and put it there and snug it in behind the building and have the lights. I mean, everything is compacted behind the building. At one time, we had discussed doing a much more grandiose thing out there and all that has been scaled back tremendously. So I'm, I'm a little confused by this reference to us surrendering the right to ever do that. I don't agree with that. I'd like to review whatever data points or sign documents. I don't know what you do about all that. But this structure is what we were recommended to do by Historic to come talk to you guys instead of avoiding you guys and just going and putting something in structure. I mean, we can go and put in couches or chairs. We gotta do something with the space. We have tables. We could go do all that. We're trying to design this to work with the neighborhood, not work against the neighborhood, to work with Historic, not against the neighborhood, or against Historic. My time's up, but thank yeah. you all very much. Thank you. Okay, close public hearing. Discussion?
while we're just waiting, so you, you did bring up about the string lighting. I just had a question about that. So we have never approved that before. Um, uh, is it a is it something maybe we've done as far as a temporary? I just if you, any other kind of history about that would be good. There haven't been any requests, so we didn't know these were went up. All these permits either stated no lighting or if there is lighting, come back to staff, and, and they didn't. Um, what we were dealing with is, is very vague guidelines that say exterior lighting fixture shall be compatible in style, size, scale, and material with the character of the structure and the neighborhood. And that's pretty much it. So our first thought was maybe all the lighting should be ground level should be ball or something like that. But we're really looking for direction from you on how to handle this particular case, how to handle light cases in the future. I'm sure people will be asking for this. We, we just didn't quite know what to do. Okay. Does the staff feel like there's a distinction to be made in this district versus the violation case that we just heard? Um, yeah, yes, they are very different. This this particular case is a rear yard request, and that case was a rooftop request. So, I mean, there's lots of, if you think they're appropriate, there's lots of clarifications we can put on it, and we can also continue talking about this beyond this case. You know, maybe it's only a certain percentage. Maybe it's only in the rear yard. Maybe it's only in zones outside of the National Register Zone. Maybe, I mean, there's lots of different ways we could go about it, but without with with just this one sentence, we weren't quite sure where to guide this applicant. Is there another follow-up question on the lighting? Um, does the staff see a difference between the, I guess, depending on the purchase of these or the description or their string lights? Um, all these pictures are from a commercial application. I can see a scenario where seasonal temporary, not so temporary lighting would go up on non-commercial spaces. Um, do the guidelines, I haven't read them in detail, but do they do they make a distinction between those two? Is this more far-reaching in this and other districts, they the more residential don't, but, character? Yeah, they don't, but just across the board, we've never reviewed temporary lighting. So holiday lighting, we've never reviewed it because it's only up temporarily. Um, my guess is, we haven't talked to all these people yet, that these are all fairly permanent. They're not up for a specific event or a specific holiday. They're meant to be at least two or three seasons, you know, that they're not just holiday lighting. One more question about the lighting that um, you guys might know better, but is it, wasn't it, it's not hanging on the structures, it's hanging between the structures, I think, is what um yeah, hanging between the structures. So I could really see if it was on the structure, but maybe between the structures. I think if, if I'm reading the drawing right, part of it is being permanently attached to the building as a, a, a structural right. support. Yeah, support. I imagine they could pretty easily fix that if that were, if we were to make that distinction. I'm not sure at the yeah. end of the day, do we want to split those hairs or do we want the staff out policing? temporary lighting on historic homes and there's just a lot yeah. of questions here. Well, like, I don't want to belabor lighting, but like if looking at the photographs, the top left and the top right, they're actually affixed to an awning, you know, whereas the middle one is kind of between a space. So I may have a just a different feeling about it. You know, one, one is kind of changing. I, I, I see that there's a difference there, but I guess, is there a difference there? Yeah. Um, Talk about lighting and more. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, with regards to the, you know, obviously we always want to be sensitive to the neighborhoods and everything, and and you know their neighbors. But I mean, most of the arguments I did hear, you know, had to do with um, use and that's not under our purview and um, so you know if it fits with the design guidelines that's what we look at so um, I agree with the staff recommendation personally. Well, I tell you if you want to make a motion we can still discuss it some more since you've started it. Well do we need to discuss the lighting more? If we make a motion to approve to staff recommendations then that would be Okay, we can I don't wait. Know. The lighting, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll have to say that um, 
it's in the back. The lighting doesn't really bother me from an architectural standpoint. I think that uh, whether they have lighting going across or, or a different kind of lighting doesn't really bother me at all. And so I, I agree with you that, that what we're talking about, the staff recommendation, approves the structures that they are building and there's only suggestion about lighting. I, I personally would uh, make a motion to uh, Mr. Chairman to to adopt the um, recommendation of the of staff for 1322 Sixth Avenue North. Okay, and um, just a clarification, because you brought up the lighting, part of their recommendation does say that an, another type of ground, li another type of lighting. Um, so, would you like to address that part of their recommendation? With the caveat that uh, they are, are allowed to put the string lighting up. Okay, I'm gonna. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Sorry. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So under discussion, can we uh, maybe give a little bit more clarification to the lighting just um, to help staff out, help ourselves out too? Like maybe it um, uh, can be temporarily uh, uh, attached to the physical structures or could, um, could, I don't want to leave to you guys could, if you want to maybe you guys want to discuss that differently but could you could you maybe enlighten me a little bit further why um, another type of ground lighting should be used rather than the string lighting is it is it ambiance is it is it um, aesthetic or uh, uh, <coughs> for us it was about the lighting being up so high and then possibly bleeding into property owners Neighboring so property owners would it be higher than the fence they're proposing to build. I don't. I think it goes. I think it'd be a little bit taller than the fence because it's going. It's attaching to the building. It's going to that sign in the middle, and then it's going back out to the top of the cabanas, which is a little taller than the fence. So and that was the concern that it would be visible. Possibly, you know, that, that it possibly could be seen. That was the concern that it possibly could be seen. Um, one argument might be just to say that this is perfectly appropriate in rear facades, and then we can continue to talk in more depth about more direction for future projects. Well, we certainly wouldn't want to disrupt a neighbor's bedroom and sleeping from... from the from foot this. candles will be really low, though, for this, so um, it's not like I doubt it will be shining in windows too much because of the um, voltage of each one of the lights. Okay. But um, based on what Robin said, then I think you're, um, you're, um, you're, you're basically saying this, maybe if you want to clarify, it's appropriate for uh, the exterior uh, of a building and not toward the front, and then we can continue to deal with this more. I think if, um, to provide what you asked for, or really, the limited amount of information that's um, provided in the guidelines 5.4.2, exterior lighting fixtures shall be compatible in style, size, scale, and material with the character of the structure and neighborhood, um, you know, irrespective of use. That's really what we have to go with. And then following that, avoid spilling light onto adjacent structures, signs, or properties is the next bullet pointed or the next numbered guideline and then ground mounted light fixture spotlights shall be screened from public view. The, those are the three things that are in the guidelines uh, other than precedents or, or, or other factors that might influence our decision. Okay, well seeing that, could I, can I amend my motion? Absolutely. Okay, I would like to um, uh, recommend, uh, make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation in its entirety for the property at 1322 Sixth Avenue North. Okay, so you're changing it. I'm to, changing it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we had a. I'm sorry. I've, now I've got a little bit confused here because we had a motion and a second based on the first one. Should his her amendment changes that? Um, it, 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 she can withdraw the original motion and then. Go. Okay. Good. Good stop. Okay. I withdraw the original motion. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do you mind restating your 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 new motion, Mr. Chairman? I would like to adopt the staff recommendations for 1322 Sixth Avenue North. Okay. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Okay. No second. So motion. Uh -oh. Motion passed. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
I just want to, since there's been public record, public comment on the cabana versus, you know, that, that conversation, I don't think we've really had any conversation about that other than lighting. <clears throat> Um, we did get stuck on lining. Yeah, did so. Just again, because we've got a lot of public comment on that, or some very assertive public comment on that. Um, you know, we we hear you know staff. We we d depend on staff to to have those reviews, and um, they have recommended approval of the um, outbuilding planning box and signage. Um, and I, I think just again to reiterate that when we look at the applicable design guidelines, <clears throat> which is 2.0 new construction within historic context, context um, it seems that this design um, is within those guidelines. So you all have any other comment about the opposition to that because of the guidelines being followed. I think in terms of it, it just rises to the level of being a building, I mean, if you will. I, I think a pertinence might, might, I mean, a canvas awning to control, you know, high frequency noise, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> I'm, <laughs> that, that, I'm, I'm having trouble trouble following that, I, th I think both the applicant has stated, um, I don't want to get too wrapped around what I think neighbor, adjoining neighbors are concerned about, which are things that we, we, we don't have um, a tremendous use, use issues and, and parking issues we don't have a tremendous amount of control over, uh, you know, for a different time and place. And so I, I think you're right. You come back to, you know, does um, the design, 2.9.4 design of outbuildings um, shall not be visually disruptive to the character of surrounding buildings? Does it meet that litmus test and, and that, um, you know, that they be subservient in nature? I, 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 I'm, I'm exactly. nodding my head on, on, on a lot of those things. I'm not seeing a, a reason considering this as a building to, to say that it doesn't comply. I'm having trouble finding ways in which it doesn't. Yeah. I, I think Whether I, it's wanted or not, I'd have right. trouble finding a, a place Based on in, our guidelines. in the guidelines where that's the case. And I think that's what, uh, you know, we want to have the public hear is that when we make decisions like this, um, you know, with strong public comment that our, our decisions are based on these guidelines. And if they are within guidelines, then we make those decisions appropriately. Just commenting. Thank you, Manet. I think one of the things, too, is that uh, the guidelines and, and the talk about light spilling onto adjacent properties. Uh, the staff have recommended a particular type of lighting that would accomplish that. I'm not so sure we need to specify the particular type of lighting, but if we put in the condition that it not be available from adjacent properties. When you look at it, the cabanas are almost nine feet tall. Uh, the, they're on either side of this are the applicant's properties as well, as well as in front. So I think that it would be possible for them to meet a pretty easy standard of not being visible from adjacent properties from the lighting standpoint. Okay. Can I comment on that as well? I think it's really reasonable, Cyril, thank you for saying that, because the examples that you see on those are commercial, and so you don't have that over spray of light to, you know, residential um, application, per se. So based on that, with with respect to 1322 Sixth Avenue North, I recommend that um, uh, that this be approved uh, with staff recommendations, with the stipulating stipulation that rather than a specific type of lighting specified, that the lighting not be visible from adjacent neighbor adjacent neighbors. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Okay. Motion carries. Okay, 406, 408 Broadway. Hi, 
All right, the building located at 406 Broadway, which is the three-story building on the right here, was constructed circa 2001 as an addition, as a side addition to the historic Victorian commercial building located at 408 Broadway, which is the, the four-story building on the left. Um, that historic um, commercial building was previously home to Friedman Music and Loan Company. The building at 406 Broadway does not include an entryway, but rather is served by the storefront at 408 Broadway. Um, the three-story building at 406 Broadway, um, as it was constructed in 2001, does not contribute to the character of Lower Broadway. Uh, so the request before you is to replace the first-story windows with operable doors, to alter the height of the transoms on the storefront, and to replace the existing operable second-story doors with new operable doors at 406 Broadway. Uh, so no changes are proposed to the, the historic building at 408 Broadway, which is the, the four-story um, portion shown on the left. Uh, so there are no changes proposed for the third story of 406 Broadway. Um, the existing brick third-story windows and second-story transoms will all remain. Um, the applicant does propose to replace the existing casement operable doors on the second level uh, with new casement operable doors. Um, the existing railings, which aren't shown here, but you could see um, on the previous photo, uh, they are to remain. Um, no changes to the size of the second story openings are proposed. Um, staff finds that the proposed second story alterations are appropriate uh, since the structure is not historic and no changes are proposed to the dimensions of the existing doors and transoms. The applicant also proposes to replace the existing storefront windows on the first level uh, with an operable aluminum framed glass window wall system. Uh, the proposal includes um, reducing the height of the existing transom by, by about half and increasing the height of the window openings. Uh, no changes to the bulkhead are proposed. Uh, so historically, transoms lined up with the top of the door opening, uh, while the storefront shown here on the left at 408 has been altered. Altered, um, an appropriate transom height is reflected uh, with that reconstruction, so you'll see that there. Um, and here are a couple of other examples of historic storefronts that also illustrate um, appropriate transom height, um, and these include on the left 101 Broadway and on the right 401 Broadway. So staff finds that replacing the existing storefront windows with a glass wall system um, on the first level could be appropriate as long as the plan maintains a transom and window height that is appropriate for the context. Uh, in this case, the window and transom height should be com should complement the historic structure at 408, uh, which includes transoms that reflect an appropriate historical height. Uh, the proposed alterations to the storefront window and the transom height are inappropriate as the proposed transom height is not compatible with historic heights. Section 3.A.1 of the design guidelines states that, quote, the relationship of the width to height of windows and doors and the rhythm of solids to voids in new buildings shall be visually compatible with the surrounding buildings. Um, altering the, the transom height on this addition uh, will not be visually compatible with the storefront proportions on the historic building um, on the left. Uh, so for this reason, staff finds that the proposal does not meet section 3.A.1 of the design guidelines. Um, staff finds that revising that proposal so that the height of the transom windows on the first level um, remain um, essentially the proportions they are, which are similar to the existing storefront transom windows um, at on the historic portion at 408, uh, would meet the design guidelines and, and recommends this as a condition of approval. So in conclusion, uh, staff recommends approval with the conditions that the height of the transom windows on the first story be the same as the existing transom windows, as well as those on the storefront of 408 Broadway, and that staff approve the windows and doors prior to purchase and installation. Okay. Thank you. Quick clarification. I, I think I know the answer to this, but you know what happens when you assume the doors that are proposed for the second story, those swing in, correct? Correct. Okay. Any more questions for staff? Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Would the applicant like to come forward? State your name and address. Yeah, I do have uh, one handout I'd like to distribute, if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Josh Hughes. I'm with Tuckett Architects, 410 Elm Street. Um, 
if it also be possible to bring up the larger photo of the front of the building, I think that'd be helpful for argument I'm gonna attempt to make. Um, I'm not gonna, this, the, what I passed out is just a um, kind of a survey of different storefronts along Broadway. I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but mainly just to illustrate that there's a lot of variety down there. Um, some are obviously historic storefronts and some are infill buildings, um, but the proportions vary from one building to next and some of them don't have transoms at all. Um, so I, I kind of jumping into the argument, I, w I, I would like to clarify that these two buildings are separate parcels. They, when, when the infill building was built in 2001, uh, they were separate parcels and they still remain to this day separate parcels, although they do share the same, the same entry and the same operator. Um, obviously, the historic guidelines require that new, that uh, storefronts on historic buildings match what was there historically, um, but in my opinion, they um, provide greater flexibility for infill buildings, uh, just that they should be compatible with their surrounding buildings. Um, the guidelines also say that that it's desirable to distinguish them from um, historic construction, so I think some some level of deviation is desirable. That's kind of up to you guys to decide what amount of deviation. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to propose a, another alternative, which would be to eliminate the transom altogether and just make the entire opening operable glass wall. Um, if you look at the 408 building, the transom on the historic portion is not as pronounced as what you would see in many historic storefronts. Um, and to me, that opening reads as one opening adjacent to either side of the door. Um, and it's really the bulkhead above all of the openings that is the stronger element. So eliminating the transom and making that all um, operable glass wall uh, I think would still be maintaining with the, the guidelines requirement that the opening dimensions, proportions, and rhythm of an infill building be consistent with, with the surrounding buildings. Um, so again, just looking for a little bit more leeway given that this is a, a new construction infill building. And with that, I'll defer back to you guys and answer any questions you may have. So just to restate, eliminating the transom altogether in the 408 building. In, in my opinion, from an, I mean, just upon further consideration, that that would, um, given that the, the 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 408 building is the transom is so underpronounced, that would I think would be a good compromise to not not having the exact alignment of the transoms and having those openings read consistent. So if you eliminated those, how tall would those doors be? about nine feet. I also am kind of curious about some dimensions on either building. Um, I, want to, I don't want to make a convenient argument for one and then ignore the other. And I guess part of what I'm getting to is something you pointed out, which is that the facade share a, a common entrance and, and you know we don't have guidelines written for a specific instance or this specific mm -hmm. um, case and so I wonder if if there were a door because they're separate parcels if there were a door added to one would it look appropriate to not have a transom and have two narrow very narrow doorways that are nearly 10 feet tall or even a single door is that compatible um, it, I'm, I'm having a hard time sort of separating that and allowing for um, tremendous variance if they share a common entrance and segregating the two from each other. That it, it's it's a it's a dicey proposition, right? Well, maybe very that's it, digging way down in the weeds, but I, I think this one sort of that's where we find ourselves. I think if it I mean if it was a separate infill building, there there are examples um, in that pack. But sorry that have passed out that of storefronts that don't have transoms at all. I think, uh, is it um, Mellow Mushroom was recently constructed. It has no, no transom whatsoever. Um, 
above their their storefront windows. Sure, and and point taken. Do you, do you know if the um, if the wainscot at the bottom if it matches between these two buildings? I mean, like matches exactly. It looks close, but are they similar, same, exact? I have not measured it, I've, mm -hmm. but based on the previous drawings for the building, I think that was the intent, I believe. Any more questions for the applicant? Okay, thanks, Josh, and you can have two minute rebuttal if there's more sure. comments. Um, open public hearing, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, no public hearing. Um, no rebuttal, so there's no one saying anything. Okay, okay close public hearing. Uh, discussion? I think I'm a little confused, <laughs> or clarity here. Um, so the applicant is, is it the same number one that he's asking for on the recommendation? that the height of the transom windows on the first story be the same height as existing transom versus he just, I heard him say to change those into full glass doors. So that's, is that correct? Full, yeah. Okay, so that's not what's on this application? No. Okay. Okay, did, did anybody hear the, need the clarification? You can come forward, I guess, and let's make sure it's, does that answer your question? I, I think so. Uh, open public room, just. Say that one more yeah. time, please. So, so my understanding of that is that the, the transom on the first story would be the same height as the existing transom windows. Uh, okay, well, I, I thought that was referring to the transoms above the, the doorways on the, on the front floor, on the, on the second story. So we are we are keeping the transoms as as they currently exist on the second story, or at least that's our proposition. And you're asking for the full length on the first floor. I think we we would be happy with either a reduced transom from what it currently is or a full height. And I think the argument is 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 the same to match it for either for either case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Close public hearing. Um, just for conversation, I guess, see what you guys feel like. But I feel like there's some rhythm that's been still um, it's happening, even though it's a new infill. Um, so no transom to me um, bothers me be more than even the reduced. I'd rather it stay reduced than no, but be interested to hear what the rest of the commissioners have to say about that. Well, and I think the argument that it's an infill building and not the same as the adjacent one is sort of countered by the treatment of that first floor yeah. that's been established because uh, the, the infill between the windows, the band above the windows is all making it read as one building even though the upper stories are clearly separate. So, so my sense is that the staff has made the right call on this and uh, I, would, I would move that we accept uh, on 40648 Broadway staff recommendations and approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay. 420 North 16th Street. Okay, 420 North 16th Street, and this is an application to construct a new house on a vacant lot shown there. Um, just for reference, here are houses that make up the historic houses that make up the immediate context. The top two images are the adjacent houses to the left and right of the vacant lot. 
and the bottom images are the two houses immediately across the street. Uh, these are all one and a half stories, uh, as are other houses nearby, until you get about two blocks away, where you do start to see two-story houses. Uh, the new house uh, will be 27 feet 6 inches tall and 33 feet 4 inches wide, uh, reading from the front as a one or one and a half story form, similar to that of a minimal traditional ha uh, mid-century house. Uh, the overall height and scale are compatible with the surrounding context. Um, here's the, uh, the left side, the re right side, and rear. Uh, I'll come back to those, but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about the adjacent or surrounding historic context first. Uh, here are some more one and a half story houses on this street. Uh, these are all craftsman style houses. Not that every house nearby is craftsman, but uh, these are uh, uh, representative of one and a half story houses nearby. Uh, and these all have a change in materials from the first story to the upper story, uh, which is common, but again, not all houses have a material change between floors. Uh, but when it's present, they typically correspond to the floor level. Uh, there's some material change there. Um, the, um, the, the space between the top of the windows and that material change is typically 18 inches to 24 or 30 inches um, above the window heads uh, below or between the window heads and the material change. Um, here are some one and a half story Victorian houses. Uh, the second floor level is less clearly defined uh, with these. There's not always a material change. Uh, and part of that uh, ambiguity uh, there, in, at least as it's perceived, is because Victorian houses have taller ceilings, commonly, and taller windows as well. Uh, but still, typically, the floor level, the upper floor level, does correspond with the uh, the bearing of the, uh, or essentially the eave line of the building. Um, Victorian houses, craftsman houses, again, those are, uh, probably make up the, the predominance of historic houses nearby. But those are just styles and really, you know, looking at forms uh, across styles. You see a similar relationship between the window proportion and the wall height and the eave height. Uh, on houses that are contributing uh, to the historic character of the neighborhood. Uh, there's uh, roughly floor levels there. Um, so back to the uh, current proposal. While the, the front reads as one story on the sides, it takes more of a one and a half story appearance. Uh, and there are one and a half story houses in the context. But the composition of this is not typical of historic houses. Uh, for one, the, uh, the second floor level it's not distinguished on the exterior. Again, that's not always the case uh, that it would be. But uh, here, that floor level, you know, approximately maybe two feet or so, two and a half feet above the window heads. But then you have a material change that's much higher. Um, there doesn't appear to be a reason why the f material change happens there, where on historic houses, there's clearly a, a logical reason for it to be where it's historically located. Um, part of the, or a, a secondary result of, of having a uh, atypical location for the material change between levels is that you have windows, that the windows and, and sills actually extend down below into the first story material, which is also uh, not typical of the proportion and location of windows that you would see on historic houses. Uh, moving on from that, the roof, uh, you know, from the front, it, as I said, it has a side gabled form, typical of many historic houses. Um, but here you have, oh, we'll come back to that. Let me, st let me go to the porches first. Um, the front porch. The front porch uh, projects from the main massing of the building, uh, but it has its sides enclosed. Uh, the right side is fully enclosed. The left side has a punched opening. Um, 
Uh, there's also a sort of a, a congestion, a uh, projection from the mass of, of the front facade into the porch area, which is not typical. Typically you have open porches, you know, all those houses on the examples in the surrounding context have open porches uh, that are sort of tr tradition, uh, transition from the massing of the house, uh, you know, to the, to the public street in front. Um, the proposed front porch doesn't share that relationship uh, with historic houses because it, uh, it doesn't share in the openness. Uh, now to the roof. So the front slope of the roof has a 14-12 pitch, which is uh, very steep um, compared to historic houses uh, in this area. Uh, the rear slope has an 8-12 pitch, and then the front porch has a 12-12 pitch, which again is, is fairly steep, uh, at least for front porches compared to historic houses in the area. Uh, but moreover, it's not typical of buildings historically to have every section of roof have a different roof pitch. Uh, so that's, again, something staff found that really wasn't compatible with, with what you see on historic houses uh, in the surrounding area. Um, and, uh, and summing up, staff did find the massing of the, the building, the, the height and width to be compatible. And those other proportions are, are exterior, uh, certainly important. But in summary, staff does recommend approval of the application to construct a new one and a half story house at 420 North 16th Street with conditions that the exterior cladding is revised so the material change is more typical of one and one and a half story houses in the surrounding area, that uh, roof colors and final selections of windows and doors is approved, approved administratively, that the roofs of the building are revised to be more consistent with surrounding historic buildings, that window locations and proportions are revised to have more proportions, to have proportions more appropriate for first and second story wall spaces, that the side walls and the projecting uh, component of the front porch are removed so that it is more open in nature. Uh, and lastly, that driveway modifications uh, indicated on the plans are uh, further explained and approved administratively. With those conditions meet, met, staff finds that this application would meet the design guidelines for new construction in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, thank you, Sean. Any questions? Yeah, Sean, I, I mean, this is um, very obviously kind of a contemporary riff on a, you know, more traditional forms, um, and the use of materials is, uh, it was clear in the, um, in the presentation, and I, I, the applicant, I'm sure, can, will clarify, there's, um, we've seen and approved contemporary, more contemporary designs for houses um, in the past, but a lot of the details where you might miter a corner and turn without a corner board or you'll have you know, terminations of materials. Sometimes in the construction process, those things just end up becoming corner boards and, and the illusion starts to revert back to something more traditional, which I think would not be as as provocative as, as this is, um, and so um, th there's a I guess a question in here, one or, or question for you: the transition between the tongue and groove at the second level and that exposure to, as indicated in the drawings, to a straight lap siding, is um, yeah that's I think that's asking for a pretty tremendous amount of craftsmanship for that not to have some sort of trim piece or something that's gonna make all that have some some visual sense there. And then on the right side of that elevation, it appears there's a corner board, but then on the left, there's um, just from the drawing, it appears that the siding is, is terminating into not a corner board. Have you, are, are some of those, did some of those things, I guess, make sense to you? Or look, did you look that deeply, think that deeply, or do you, does that, you follow me? No, I, I, I wondered uh, about that as well with, with the, the vertical siding tying in or dying into the horizontal siding. Um, that's uh, a lot of a lot of points to caulk or, you know, without a, a trim band I, the or something I'm sure yeah, I can, can clarify. I j those were some deeper things that um, 
beyond just form and, and, and having a contemporary, you know, more contemporary interpretation of a traditional roof form or roof slopes that I think would, would warrant um, at least discussion or, or clarification. Yeah, maybe if, we, if, if there's some more questions with staff, maybe we'll bring the applicant up and um, she can address some of those. Um, so if the applicant would like to come forward and um, state your name and address. One thing you might start with is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm Drew Sloss, 1408 Woodland, uh, builder, future homeowner, and 13-year East Nashville resident. Um, I'd like to point out that I think the third slide was uh, presented up there was actually from an earlier revision. Um, there has been a material change. This slide, there's been a material change on the uh, projection of the front porch as well as a hole punch through. So that was our, I think our second round that we were working with staff on. Um, one of the other, see uh, if you look at that projection, that has tongue and groove on that as well, which is what the other side would look like additionally. Um, just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> So some of the project goals for this house, um, because we live on Woodland currently, is to uh, build a smaller house. Um, we've designed this to uh, land under 1,000 square foot as far as footprint goes. Um, we, we're um, aiming to have all of our family bedrooms upstairs. Um, so we have small children. And then um, we're, we're aiming for a contemporary yet appropriate style. Um, I want a brief history of this project. On May 11th, uh, I met with staff and presented a contemporary one and a half story front facing gable with front porch projection as an inspiration picture just to kind of kick off like here's where here's where we're thinking. <clears throat> the response was they were cautiously optimistic, obviously pending final details and materials, uh, but uh, 28 feet is the average height on the block, a one and a half story um, with a 31 foot historic home directly across the street being kind of an outlier. July 25th, uh, we, uh, met again with historic, uh, with a front-facing gable, massing reworked to side and uh, to side end gables with front-facing porch due to massing issues. Uh, we were just ending up with a really long, narrow house, um, which was was you know, not the intention. So uh, we had a six-foot knee wall on the front, and the staff response was, "This is a two-story house." August 3rd, Lynn and I met with Historic again and showed a reworked roof line, creating asymmetry on the side, but allowed for needed upstairs living despite less desirable head clearance, greatly reducing front elevation appearance. Uh, the staff made some suggestions in the direction of a, uh, a one-story roof pitch and also provided some feedback on windows, porch, and metal siding. <clears throat> so uh, for our final submittal that you guys are looking at, we've added windows, Remove the metal siding, um, in most cases to tongue and groove, added openings on porch walls. We also provide staff with a 14 page document attached with our application demonstrating previous historic staff justifications on one and a half and two story heights in related contexts. Um, you know, Lachlan Springs has many different heights and massing, short one stories, tall two stories, um, and infill homes even within the same block. We've met with our council person, shared our design with affected neighbors, uh, have two letters of support, one from the neighbor directly across the street, and feel like we've worked diligently to, to relate to the overall context of the street, um, was, was actually was applauded by the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association letter, I believe you guys have received, at least regarding massing scale, height, rhythm, and spacing. Uh, they and our councilmen have expressed support for our position regarding the roof pitches as they are uh, to the rear of the property. Um, we have used historic forms but interpreted them with a contemporary presentation as, our as is our understanding of our guidelines. Um, we got many examples here of staff and commission approved infill homes within Lachlan Springs that share similar non-typical characteristics to present to you today. The guideline standards have not changed and we ask that you approve our de design as submitted. And I believe Lynn can address um, your concerns as far as like how things are going to uh, meet up. Thank you. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Lynn Taylor, residential designer, and I have these boards here uh, because some of the concerns we didn't really get or understand until the after with the recommendations. And so uh, number three, I think Drew mentioned, is incorrect. That was a prior revision to this. So number three elevation is real similar to this elevation as far as the opening and materials and the line. Um, so in regards to... Um, 
number one concern. There has been many new infill approved with atypical cladding and materials. There are some materials never before used in the historic overlay, and there's some materials that I don't think have ever been found on a historic house. We would just like a fair and the same uh, consideration as these people, designers, these guys on the house. There's a couple here that are mine, but uh, 1419 Holly, skirt board intersects around the midpoint of the, wind of the front facing window. 1521 Fatherland, steel post on the front porch, 10 inch exposed lap side at the base of the house, tongue and groove cypress siding on the front porch. The duplex at 1312 Forest has skirt boards that go up and down all over the place. Uh, six inch la uh, exposed lap siding on the bottom half of the house and atypical skirt board locations on that house. We have photographs of these. Um, 1701 Russell, unusual siding detail and pattern with vertical battens throughout. 303 South 14th Street uh, has four by eight sheets of, I'm sorry, I should be taking a break right now. <laughs> 303 South 14th Street, four by eight sheets of hardy panels are the main materials on the house. Now that house is in um, East End, so I wanna be clear about that, but I'm talking about the materials allowed in East Nashville historic overlays. In regard to uh, number three, concern. We have five different pitches overall. We need headroom and upstairs and egress windows and the only reason we did the dormers on the back is because of the egress and the headroom uh, we, because we lowered the knee wall based on what Sean had told us. Uh, 606 Holly Street has seven different roof pitches. None, no mention of that in their recommendation. 1805 Forest shows six different roof pitches. No mention of that either. 1521 Fatherland has an atypical Extended front facing gable with an exaggerated overhang. It must be around three feet out. 1408 Woodland has an asymmetrical front, front facing gable with two different roof pitches. That's where Drew lives. That was one of my designs. Uh, 303 South 14th Street and 321 South 11th Street have atypical roof shapes. And one of the houses that we found, and I do not know the address, but it is in Lachlan Springs, had a unusual 2012 pitch on a bump out on the first floor on the left side of it, okay? Now, in regards to number four concern, we believe we've satisfied the requirements and the guidelines with the number seven proportion and rhythm of the openings. The main house side gable is only 22 feet deep. I'm not sure how many more windows we could add. We did add some based on um, Sean's comments. We have filled the wall space with correctly sized windows on the front and the side gables of the house. Asymmetrical window placement and sizes have been allowed in this neighborhood, as you can see from the photographs. Um, they're just to back up what I'm saying here. Uh, 1521 Fatherland, the right side, and this is a corner lot, the right side elevation has three different sizes of widths in those casement windows and a descending width uh, together. Sorry about that. The duplex at 1312 Forest, the windows are, are different sizes and different mounting heights. 1303 Forest has atypical windows in size and layout. 1408 Woodland has several casement and awning windows with different size layouts and mounting. In regards to number five concern, three doors down from 16th Street is a historic Tudor with an enclosed porch with punched openings on the side. Our front porch is open, it is not enclosed. There's only about six foot eight of wall and now we have punches in that. It's very little wall area on that side so it, it isn't um, enclosed. Our house design for the front porch is inspired by historic forms per the guidelines. The porch design is a mixture of a craftsman front facing gable and Tudor porches from around the property. 1303 Forest has a larger interior projection on the sh uh, shallow depth porch. Um, this, uh, when they told us we couldn't do an interior porch projection, I didn't think there was any, but we found them. And this one right here is actually larger than our, ours that we are doing. So they have approved it and allowed it and didn't make comments in their uh, recommendations on that project. That was 1303 Forest. 1409 Russell has an interior projection into a shallow porch, front porch. 1406 Holly Street has an enclosed front porch on the second floor. We have not seen any of this on historic houses in the neighborhood. 
there, and again, there's photographs of this. 321 South 11th Street has an entry projection on its front porch and includes a water feature. That front porch, that front elevation isn't anywhere else in the neighborhood. Now that is an e uh, uh, east uh, end house. And um, let's see, you were talking about that material change. That is vertical siding that uh, will go over, lap the um, bin. It will overlap it about an inch. There will be no caulking. The, uh, the thickness of a uh, hardy plank board is about an eighth of an inch once it gets to that point. Uh, we would like to leave that clean. Uh, we do not want to move that line. I can't tell you how far that line is up. That line is just where it needs to be design-wise as far as I'm concerned. And, and my, if we, my, my question was, more, so you'll have ingrain exposed at the bottom of that tongue and groove. Essentially, that's the details. It's all going to be painted, I believe. Well, I don't, I mean, well, I, I just want to understand it. I don't, I, I'm not yeah, questioning I mean, it's, no, the goal would to not be having. Injury. Yeah. I think you would have to break. Sorry. I think you'd have to Z break flashing underneath. Sure. And around oh, yeah. and around uh, to, to. So yeah. there'll be in lieu of even a three quarter inch piece of trim that would close that. You're. Mm -hmm. We just want a real thin line. You know, Z to, to to close that off, so you're not seeing end grain and and it sort of breaking apart. And I'd originally talk, I'd forgotten about that. Sure. I'd originally talked about a metal drip edge that will be the same color as the wood and the paint and everything. Okay. Uh, I do um, durability details on my drawings. So okay. We on the, and we're, I, I just was curious to understand. A lot of times, what we'll see, and my questions are, we won't see. Um, the design will maybe turn the corner and have you know more contemporary, harder, more mm -hmm. expensive construction to build, and then corner board suddenly gets slapped up on the house. Yeah, and I, uh, and so I, forth. I think about all those details around okay. my, no, my no houses, doubt. and um, we were trying to keep them clean. Um, modern design. We don't want to move the skirt board where it's always at on a craftsman. Uh, as you can see, there are many houses in the neighborhood that they did not enforce that on. We don't want to do it. We don't want to make it look like a craftsman. The only reason the two roofs are, are different pitches, because they ask us to bring it down to a one story. At our third meeting, you know, Sean started talking about a one story. And so we're like, we have to get headroom up in the, the second floor, or we just need to go ahead and do a one story. However, we, we also, in our research, found a few houses that are two story new houses on blocks with no one story. I mean, no, two, no historic two story houses. So we feel we could even do a two story here if we really wanted to, but based on all the other two stories that have been allowed in the neighborhood. But my client here, he just wants to keep a shorter, smaller footprint home for his family. Okay. Ben, before, did you get all your questions answered? Oh, I don't want to, uh, my questions can be outside of the time that the applicant has. I don't, don't want to Oh, yeah, we're outside of it anyway, so. But so, if you have questions, go ahead. Yeah, ask. I do, um, just, and these are follow-up, not challenging, uh, these aren't challenges, Lynn, to what's drawn, is just an understanding, or that it's compliant or not compliant. I, I just want to understand, as we consider it, I don't want to project what I think it is onto what your design is, and, and could you, uh, I'm looking specifically, eh. oh, it's not, it's the slide after the front elevation. It's the one they were done. Yeah, so it, l it just looks like um, there's, a, on, there's a corner board indicated on the um, lap siding that extends, you know, even up there's that little bit of bearing that, or that little bit of exposed um, where it transitions from the horizontal siding to the vertical siding. It looks like a corner board runs from bottom to top there. And then as you turn the corner, will there also be a, a small corner board there or is on that detailed? On the front side? Of, well, on the, this would be on the rear side oh, of the house. Um, the corner boards run all the way up to the eaves. And they would be so on both sides So the material has a complete dead end. Okay. And that would be right and left side of this drawing. All, all sides on this will have a Great. corner board. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure uh, I understood. Or if you look at the back one, and I'm sorry, if you look at the very back side of that, I believe it might be a sliver. And so it comes out so the material can die into it. We did the same detail on 1408 Woodland, and so it is. You are we are capable of building it that way. Sure, and so that would be a three-quarter inch exposure, or whatever the width of the board is it's, on this side, and it's very thin. It's just a tad. And the other is, yeah, I'm, I'm following you, and I think I understand the detail. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't misreading it. The uh, and then is there just a very narrow three-quarter inch um, trim? around the window opening at the porch on both sides. Is that also correct? Um, that would be a, a, a one by eight flat mm -hmm. 
to go right up against that and trim it out. Trim it we out. did sure. that on uh, the three houses at 16th and Boscobel. Okay. Those openings were done that way. I, uh, and I, I think I'm, I follow you, and I think so. I'm, I'm reading the drawings as to the one as more to thing intent. about that roof. I mean, we originally started with it the same pitch. And we had a, I think we had a little window above the front window, and that wasn't, they didn't like that. So that's when the roof got caulked down, and there's no uh, little two by two window above the front windows. Sure. Okay. We can always add a, a window to the left side of the door, front door, because it does look like a, a space I just noticed actually today. And are there any, fi yeah, final question before I, I, I don't, I may have missed this on the notation. Does the window have a pretty standard? Casing like a casing detail, but just narrower. Uh, it, it will have a casing detail. We would like to do a more narrow. It doesn't two and a have quarter to be brick, or something. Well, yeah. brick molding. It can be a two by two, or but I will detail that out, and we'll do metal drip edge on the top. But we would like a, a slimmer. Again, this this is only 22 feet. I mean, sure. 22 feet is not very much. So more more contemporary interpretation of what right, would otherwise right. be a one by so four. So we okay. would like to use a narrow <coughs> than the typical one that is. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, uh -huh. everybody. Um, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay. Seeing none, close public hearing. Discussion? Good questions, Ben. Lynn, I've, I've got... I, I said it was my last question. I, I, I was. It wasn't. Um, One more question for you, Lynn. Yeah, I wanted to. I want to understand sort of the innies and outies on the front porch. In okay. in reading the, I'm looking at the plan and sort of the. Um, if we flip between the front elevation, so the on the left side of the front facing porch, the vertical siding sort of runs up. That's in the same plane. It runs up and creates a gable form in the second floor, um, and it's the. So that's out at, um, let's say, two feet out from the face, whatever it is. Is the part that's just to the right of that, where we go from vertical to horizontal siding, is that out further, or can is it flush or back in? I got this pointer that has a laser thing on it. Can, uh, you, look, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. You see this plane right here where the front door is? That's back in flush. That's the same plane yeah. as uh -huh. this. Then this steps out some. Uh-huh. And then this steps out even further. If you look on the second floor, you might be able to see it a little bit better. You see the dotted lines. And, and I saw that. So and there's th a little alcove right here. And here's where we could add another, like, two by two window. And then the whole frame of the whole outside comes out the furthest. So that yes. one by six or whatever that it's depth a one is. One by eight. One by eight comes all the way out. All the way up and out and this. This is why we say the porch isn't enclosed. Sure. I, then that, it's, it's crystal clear to me now. Thanks. Okay. okay thanks, Lane. Put you on the spot a little bit, Cyril, but um, this seems like it's such an architectural thing. Can you give maybe some of your comments to this, some of your first blushes? When you have a house that's that's small that you're trying to get a lot of program into, um, I, you know, I, I see where the staff has come from. Uh, I'm still in the process of thinking through it, so I think more discussion will help out. So, pose the question of um, just you know I should go right to the guidelines to see what your both of you I mean everybody's opinion is as far as it is new I mean it's it's new in Phil. Um, it. I mean, uh, many of the guidelines, it seems like it might actually meet from my, you know, just the roof, some of the roof pitches, but some of the, the actual scale, I think it's, what do you guys feel like about the scale? It feels like the scale might be right for yeah. this, yeah. this infill. I, I find, I find the scale is, is yeah. appropriate to the neighborhood and, and it, you know, it's a, it's a reasonably scaled, yeah. mm -hmm. more so than a lot of applications we see out. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't find the scale as is um, distinctively different or, or jarring or, or greatly from, from the surrounding. You know. It's actually refreshing to see something at this scale. <laughs> I, I'm just another thing too, I almost feel like some of the changes that were brought up 
might fit it better because it's new and feel, you know, because if it took on a different character, it might change, you know what I mean? Then the, the whole character changes if we put too many of the, some of these on it. But what do you guys feel about that? Muddy the contemporary. Like, yeah, muddy, kind of like, oh, wait, well, I was contemporary, but now I'm trying not to be. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think based on the applicant's response and, and a track record of thoughtful consideration of details, whether you like contemporary interpretation or not, it, it's not like it's a single line drawing where it's just going to get built. Who, uh, whoever builds it, it's going to get built yeah. however they choose. I, I, I see these things as intentional. Now, whether the staff feels like they're appropriate or not or they meet the guidelines is another question. I, I don't think it's for lack of of thoughtfulness or skill that this is put together. And, and I think it certainly is, as a contemporary interpretation has been, you know, a, a, a certain, um, it, contemporary rules have been applied to try to make something that, that is, is di distinctly different and, and purposefully different. Yeah. So and, push, yeah. I'm recalling, uh, you know, and, and we, Oftentimes, or we've reviewed cases in the past where, you know, the culmination, it's not any individual one thing that we've approved in the past. The culmination of things yeah. might cause the, the staff to evaluate something one way or the other. And, and um, I, I wasn't sure what we were going to um, hear in, in the presentation today, certainly reviewing the application beforehand. I, I, I saw the points being made, but I'll say, um, I know I've been a part of approving some of these details on previous projects where there was some discussion, but and on their own, they just they were certainly distinctly new construction, and they were distinguished from something that was historic. And the differing roof pitches I, I, is one of those that I just I don't find as um, yeah. causing me great consternation. Um, and, and we don't review paint color, but I, I don't think that in and of itself would. Um, make it out of place necessarily. Yeah. Um. Go ahead. Oh, There's another comment that um, we got um, public comment through email, actually from the council member that you know because those roof pitches are different uh, in the rear that it's not as obvious you know to where it's inconsistent with the surrounding structures. So that made some sense as well. Maybe to, just to move on from a con conversation piece about uh, the exterior cladding, um, more typical. Um, th this is one. I'd be curious to hear what you guys all think about that. But it, to, like I said, once again, kind of back to your point, Ben. It's almost like if you look at the look at each thing individually, it's one thing. But when you look at the culmination, it's kind of another. Um, so. I'm, I'm not as put off by the cladding being different because of the type of building, what, what this really is by itself. But um, I'm curious of what the rest of the commissioners may say about that. So it doesn't have to be that five inch reveal kind of uh, guideline. Does it or does it not? Since it's a different kind of cladding. It's well. It's what there. When um, during Sean's, he talked about the different um, kind of proportions of it. That was more of what um, I believe. If if you want to see, you want to show that up, Sean. Your diagram that showed it. But um, that's. I think that's what number one meant. Yeah. Those. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just that clarify. Line there is a subfloor. I didn't see it. That was it. And then the, the material change happens there. It, it was just going to clarify. It wasn't the materials themselves. It was just where the change was happening. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Say something. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, and I, I mean, I, the material change on this one, again, doesn't cause me consternation. Um, as Ben said, for a different thing, uh, just simply because 
such a, <laughs> there's such a, I mean, from the different ones that, that we saw on, you know, not just the applicants, but on the, our own um, presentation, just there's such a mix of things in that neighborhood, it seems like, you know, some are um, the style without any material change at all, some are style with the material change, and yes, when you do have a material change, I guess it's more common to have it on the floor level, um, but you know, if this is a if this is an interesting take on you know a very modest size home, um, and you know if that's what the designer you know thinks thinks might look best for this size home, then I mean I just it it doesn't personally bother bother me in this instance since there is such a mix in the neighborhood and not everything is 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 exactly the same. Sure. So, um, and I'll as you know, since well, where are you going? I'm at you. Go yeah. First. So I move um, approval with the staff's recommendation on 420 North 16th Street, um, taking exception to the requirement number um, number one with the. Um, you know, noted exception here that this is a contemporary house that is taking forms and, and is distinctly different, but I, I don't find that that's, it's been approved and I don't, I, I, in, in both the examples given in, in the presentation here, but in things we've previously approved before, I think it's a cue to, you know, the passerby that, that this is new. Um, yeah. there are many of those cues on this project, and, and so I don't find that as contrasting greatly with, with um, other examples in the neighborhood. And, um, Number three, I think that the front-facing gable is, while steep, is is proportional and and, and doesn't um, well it may contrast it, it doesn't contrast so greatly that this is an ostentatious house on, or, or will look out of place in in its um, proportion. And um, also num number four, I think the combination the, the composition of windows is is intentional and there are sufficient number of openings uh, in the composition of each of the elevations that don't create large expanses of, of material and, and they go to making the whole piece read as a contemporary riff on, on a, you know some with some traditional form elements um, I'm not sure what the I think some clarity can be given by the applicant on the driveway modifications um, and then finally on, on item um, five, I, I, I find that the porch is um, by its nature and, and with the two openings on either side as clarified by the applicant is open enough in nature and again referring back to the contemporary nature of this application in total, it, it, I, I find it meets the guidelines for an open, per, open porch. Okay, I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Um, Robin, did that give enough information for you? Okay, a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. What's the motion? A approval. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll clarify, it's approval well, she with She tried to give it a little bit more detail, yeah. but. Um, with the conditions that the roof colors and final selection of windows and doors shall be approved administratively and the driveway modifications are approved administratively. Yeah. The typical. Absolutely, thank you. Um, just from an earlier part, we have been going for two hours. Does anybody need to take a quick restroom break or anybody else? Go ahead. Stand up. Well, if no one needs to else take a, you want to take a stand break? Oh, no, I'm just, I'm, I don't break. Okay. We don't lose quorum, so I was going to oh, keep going okay. unless anybody else wants to take a break. Keep going. Okay? You too, okay? All right. All right, we're going to keep going then. Um, we'll just, <laughs> since we don't lose quorum, we're going to keep moving. Um, I'll give you guys another chance later, okay. too. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. Okay, 1126 Shelton Avenue. It's me again. Okay, 1126 Shelton Avenue is a vacant lot. Um, it was, uh, this overlay went into effect very recently, uh, and just before the uh, adoption of the overlay, this lot was rezoned uh, SP, allowing three, uh, three 
up to three detached dwellings with the setbacks and footprints of the buildings essentially determined by the SP. So the site plan sort of was inherited um, along with the overlay. Uh, and this is actually the second application we've reviewed for this lot. Uh, same applicant, but they submitted something two months ago and then uh, deferred but it's essentially a new design, so we're treating it like a new application. Um, it is an application to construct three houses on the, the three lots as provided by the, or determined by the set plan, site plan with the SP. And the, uh, just for, for the purposes of this, I'm calling them unit one being to the top of this image facing Shelton Avenue, units two and three facing Windsor, Avenue. And unit one uh, is uh, one and a half story, uh, 26 feet tall, 36 feet wide for the primary mass with a, uh, a wing, a gabled wing on the, uh, on the side, extending the width to uh, 40 feet. Uh, the width, the height is appropriate, the width is appropriate uh, largely because this lot is 67 feet wide. Um, Units two and three are similar designs, but one will be mirrored from the other. Also 26 feet tall, also 32 feet wide, uh, and 36 feet deep. Uh, all of the buildings have um, similar materials, uh, stone columns with wooden up uppers, uh, sp split face block foundation, uh, clap cement fiber clapboard siding and board and batten siding, asphalt shingle roof, uh, staff, as always, request to review review the roof color and the window and door selections. Um, that's it. Staff recommends approval of the three infill houses at 1126 Shelton Avenue with the following conditions. That the foundation height shall be consistent with adjacent historic buildings to be verified by staff during construction. That the window and door selections are approved by staff. That the roof color uh, or colors are approved by staff. That the location of driveway, driveways, walkways, and porch stairs shall be administratively approved. And that HVAC units and other appurtenances uh, shall be located on the rears, rear facades of the buildings or behind the midpoint on non-street facing facades. Meeting those conditions, staff finds that this proposal meets the guidelines for construction in the Englewood Place Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, thank you, Sean. Would anyone else like to speak regarding this project? I mean, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've got, I guess this question for staff, make sure I'm, I'm seeing this right. Um, it appears that unit one, the left elevation shown on, on unit one here doesn't jive with the site plan. You've got a returning, um, and I, I think the drawings may be confused. You, the front is showing a returning porch, and, and that doesn't look like it returns. You know, the, uh, yeah, it actually, yeah, I think that. But I think in the staff packet, Windsor 1, <laughs> does show a returning porch, and, and which gets to my question, and I, I applaud the applicant for putting a corner house on a corner, um, always always helpful when that happens. Um, I know we've had some discussion before about which is the front door, and I just I wanna make sure the staff is satisfied that, um, you know, that it looks like, hey, this is the front door, not which which door do I take the mail to, or you know, where should where should I go and knock? Yeah. We've had extensive conversation on that before, I, and I don't know if it's warranted here. I just was curious about um, making sure that we don't, you know, you, they don't run, they, they they get what it's intended. I don't think it's a big deal. I just wanted to make sure we were we were good with it. Yes, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, uh, please, uh, I guess, refer to follow the plans in the published recommendation. Uh, I put, I mixed up a, a left elevation there, I think for Windsor one and two slash three. Um, yeah, uh, I was confident that the front on Shelton would read as more front. front. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thanks Sean. This applicant here would like to come forward. Nope. Okay, 
Uh, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, seeing none, close public hearing. Discussion or a motion? Mr. Chairman, I uh, move for approval based on staff recommendations. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Sorry. I know I could feel I'm it. Not, you, know, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know you could count on me. Uh, let me look back at, at the staff's recommendation. This, this is one I've, I've been, a, I've harped on before. The little um, bathroom transom by themselves, windows for proportion, is that, a, is that in the staff recs to, I know it's a tough detail, but. We typically uh, are not fond of those uh, because the proportion and rhythm is not compatible with typical historic houses. Nor am I. Uh, they did uh, very appropriate with the window proportions on the front. Um, and uh, we, we made sure essentially that they kept a fairly uh, compatible proportions on the front halves of the building. Uh, the rears are, you know, sort of n not much scrutiny on the rear. Uh, but then because of the situation that they, not that they were given, but that they, they bought into, uh, but it's three, three houses on one lot, which is not typical. Uh, it was, you know, already uh, uh, sort of what you're getting in terms of privacy and things were, and visibility were gonna be different than a standard house uh, or standard lot that we would review. So the rear halves of the side elevations, we, we sort of extended a little bit of that latitude as well. I'll follow up with that question. So on the corner house, there's that's not showing on either side, right? Without looking at the plans. Without looking at the plans? I mean, in detail as you have, uh, that the, corner house. The, the two street facing elevations of the corner house uh, both have very, uh, appropriate window proportions. Uh, twice as tall as they are wide. Okay. Yeah. Great. And I think for Windsor 1, because of the site plan we inherited, that one actually sticks out. You, you will see that coming up the street and up the sidewalk, and, and it looks like, I mean, that has a, a it lo you know, what appears to be, even though it's the back of the house, there, there's some window openings there, so it doesn't look awful. Mr. Chairman, could I amend my motion to, uh, to reflect that uh, the staff review of the window and door selections be uh, expanded to include proportions of windows as appropriate. Okay, we have an amended motion, we have a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, amended motion carries. Now the motion, the original motion, um, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. 3926 Cambridge Avenue. Is that okay, Robin?
Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the addition, finding that the addition's height, scale, and reform do not meet the design guidelines, uh, and specifically sections 2B1A, 2B1B, 2B1E, and 2B2 of the Cherokee Park Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. Um, and then for the outbuilding, staff recommends approval with the condition that staff approve the materials of the windows, doors, and roof color prior to purchase and installation, finding that the outbuilding does meet section 2B1 of the design guidelines. So my apologies about the mic. Um, let me know if you have any questions. That's okay. I think we were hearing you okay. So okay. thanks, Stoke. I believe Robin said that maybe we had gotten some feedback. I don't know if it's people watching on television or somewhere else couldn't hear as they were watching. We, so. We've gotten it quite a bit. So, so please use your turn your mics on. Please lean into them. Next time, I'll make sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any any questions for Melissa? Okay. Oh, and just a note, I do believe that you did receive an email yesterday um, of public comment on this case. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Would the applicant like to come forward, uh, state your case, and your name and address? Hello, I'm Van Pond. I'm the architect, 2929 Sidco Drive. Um, we're back this month. Thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. Um, we've worked with our clients, Tufik and Kristen Assad, and several members of your commission staff, <laughs> taking into account the considerations last month and your comments that were made about this project. Um, I'd like to highlight one piece of the staff recommendation that Melissa brought up about the location and size of the easement that crosses the property and effectively bisects it. Um, it is an unusual condition. It does present something of a hardship in that easements typically, in the vast majority of cases, exist along property lines at the sides and rear of a property. This does just go right down the dead middle of it. It does present a hardship for working through a design process on this project, as we talked about last month. Um, that's what I've got to say about that. For this month's revised submittal, we proposed a two-foot high ridge raise in combination with an addition that is slightly wider and taller by one foot than that ridge raise. Um, we took the commentary you all gave us last month to heart, and in part of, part of doing that, Last month's edition had a knee wall and a forward-facing dormer massing showing from the front. Um, we looked at that and really thoroughly redesigned based on your commentary and based on the idea that the guidelines want additions to defer and to not over-impact the vis visual composition of the house from the front. Um, our addition's footprint is 1,600 square feet. That includes about 350 square feet of porches. Um, the house next door at 3924, as we talked about last month, has an addition square foot footprint of 2,000 square feet. So we're actually less than that, and that house was smaller originally. Uh, for the exterior massing this month, the low eave of our addition aligns with the interior bearing height of the existing house as it faces forward. We have designed this in a manner that the whole of the addition is a side-facing gable with step-downs massing to the sides. If you could go one more. So you can see kind of the addition has actually two, in, uh, two engaged side-facing gables on both sides. Um, we do believe that from the front of the house, from the street, this low eave is going to read all this roof. Um, and that is the intent, is that we kind of read all, this is a one-story addition with a, with a roof, so we're only really seeing roof from the street on the projecting nine feet, or eight feet 11. Um, this coincides with what's been approved for the addition immediately adjacent at 3924 Cambridge Avenue, which I do want to give you all information on. There are 10 copies, so there's an extra for staff and record. Um, as those are getting passed around, um, we appreciate that Commission wants to review each project on its own merits separately. However, when there's, there is a context of neighborhood scale and there's a context of what has been done before and approved before, especially since the house next door has a very similar condition of site 
and the same condition of the east bisecting its, its space. It was allowed to be both taller and wider when it was proposed to the commission. Um, that house is essentially the same ridge height as this house is. That house sits 12 feet further closer to the street. And on your site plans that were submitted, you'll see there are lines that denote where its high ridges are and where its knee walls are. That house design incorporated a five foot knee wall 40 feet back from the front facade and rose to its full height for a four feet of the ridge line of the existing house at 50 feet behind its front facade. Of course, on our house that we're talking about today, our ridge raise is immediate. It's two feet. It is what is recommended. But our addition with its low eave rising up to a ridge, the ridge on our addition is 66 feet from the, rear, from, from the front facade of the house. It is substantially further back in relation to the front of the house than the house adjacent. Our house sits 12 feet further back. It's substantially further back from the street. We do not have any knee walls. Um, and amazingly, and not by any design, the addition at 3924 Cambridge Avenue extends nine feet to its left, as opposed to ours, which extends nine feet to its right. Um, that has something to do with where the houses were placed on the original sites. To sum up, if the easement I noted were not in the location it was, we would probably be designing something that's in the shadow line of the house, and we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. However, it is, and it is even more restrictive because of the house sitting further back on the lot than the adjacent house is. Um, we are, we would greatly appreciate your consideration in approving this design. We've been pretty careful, with solicited input and guidance from you all and your staff, um, to create an appropriately scaled footprint for the addition, as staff recommendation notes, but we do need you all to give us some consideration on the massing component, which we have drastically changed. Um, one thing, and it's not just self-aggrandizement, the last page of the packet I handed you out, this project in 2011, the house next door, 3924, which is a very large scale addition, as you can see, was given a preservation award because it was a sensitive way to add to a small house. I don't have the comments exactly, but that's what it was. That's why it was given that award. Um, I'm going to give the microphone over to the homeowner. Thank you very much. My name is Tafik Assad. My address is 3926 Cambridge Avenue. And along with my wife, Kristen Assad, we're the current owners of the house that you're considering today. My wife regret regrettably could not come because she's at home with our four-week-old daughter. Before I say a few words, I want to thank the commission and the staff for allowing us to come here today before you. I also want to thank Van, our incredible architect, our neighbor Gil Lackey, who you will hear from shortly, and other neighbors who wrote in letters of support to the commission. Um, a mention was made to an email sent yesterday. There was also an email sent today from our neighbor Bob Green, so at least two that I know of. So you're being asked today to consider this proposal objectively, and uh, Van laid out some objective facts, and I'm going to fill in some of the subjective context. So my wife and I moved from Boston four years ago, and like many northern transplants, the three-bedroom house, uh, which is the house that we originally bought, sounded enormous relative to our one-bedroom apartment in Boston. Um, however, life happens, and we've been blessed to have two children, one that I just told you was born four weeks ago. Uh, and so we were growing out of our current house. And so we started to look for larger houses uh, in our neighborhood, preferably, that could accommodate our growing family. And so what I didn't mention is that this house, this three-bedroom house that we currently live at, is 3927 Cambridge Avenue. So across the street from this proposal at 3926 Cambridge Avenue. We approached our neighbor about purchasing our house, and after some back and forth, eventually we came to some mutually agreeable terms. What I also failed to mention is that the back slope of the original roof has a gigantic hole in it, presumably from a large tree branch that fell on the house a decade or so ago. As you can imagine, there is an enormous amount of water damage in the house. There is actually no ceiling in the kitchen. There's actually exposed rotten wood beams. Uh, the night before we closed on the house, the previous seller texted us that the toilet fell through the subflooring in the bathroom. So most banks and insurance companies and actually just general people who we talked to dissuaded us from buying this house. Uh, it was a struggle. It was a back and forth, but we love our street enough that we felt that we had to. 
uh, and actually it seemed like a win-win to us. Our neighbor who currently, her, her former neighbor who obviously couldn't take care of the house, who was living in what I would describe as an uninhabitable condition, got to walk away with fair market value for her house. We got to buy a house on our street um, that we love on a bigger lot and we were able to build something that we would call our dream house. Uh, finally, this 1920s beautiful bungalow, which has now fallen under significant disrepair, would be able to be restored to its original beauty by community members, myself and wife. So we chose Van Pond as our architect very carefully because he's actually done three houses on our street before us. We'd be number four and several others in our neighborhood. Uh, we're presenting to you now for the second time, and so we were here last month, and I came personally because I wanted to hear the concerns of the staff and the concerns of the commission, and I, you know, honestly wasn't that upset when you guys said it was disapproved because I, I knew that we could work with the staff based on the guidance of the commission to find a compromise that was mutually agreeable. We emailed with the staff, met in person with the staff in the interim, uh, and, you know, I think that the meetings went very well, and we took took the request and recommendations in earnest and to our new revision. I must admit, after our, our last conversations with the staff, I was actually confident that they would agree with us in our revised renovation plan, but here we are today. So I just want to say that we are not asking, in our opinion, for anything out of proportion to renovations allowed in our neighborhood, let alone our street, let alone our immediate next door neighbor, as Van has mentioned about um, the house at 3924 Cambridge Avenue. So lastly, our two and a half year old son heard me say once, it's really sad what happened to this beautiful old house. And as only a toddler can do, he, he heard sad and said, oh, this is the sad house. And so we kind of jokingly been referring to this as the sad house. Um, and then we asked him, what should we do about it? And his response was, make it happy. And so that's kind of what we're here to do. It's toddler's logic, but that's really what we're here for. And so thank you for your time. Thank you for your careful consideration. And we're here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have questions to the applicant at this time? Okay, thank you. Open public hearing. Would um, anyone like to speak regarding Dick? Please state your name and address. Hey, I'm Gil Lackey. I'm their next door neighbor, 3924 Cambridge Avenue. Um, I wrote down some notes, and um, for fear of losing my train of thought, I'd like to just read it. Um, so my wife and I and our children, I have two kids, and we live next door to, to Feek and Kristen's property. And we have lived down the street from them for several years. Um, being the closest neighbor to this proposed addition, um, it will be the property that's most affected. Um, not only are we in favor of the proposed addition, but we've been ecstatic about it throughout the whole process. The whole street has been talking about it for a long time. Uh, Tafik was extremely generous about the condition of this house right now. It's, it's a mess. It's an eyesore, and we're grateful for someone with um, his, I don't know, conscientiousness to do a great job restoring it and making it look beautiful. Um, I know you have a huge responsibility to do what's right and to find, find solutions to the challenging properties like this one. And I know my saying, my family and our neighbors are in favor of the proposed addition uh, might not be enough to sway you. So if I may, please allow me to explain why I think it's fair and that you should allow the addition as proposed. So my property, and I wish you could see it next to their property, and, and the story behind my property is the comparable, the comparable to end all comparables for Kristen and Tafik's property. Um, I wanted to start a family but didn't want to move. I had a tiny 925 square foot house with a sewer easement running across the middle of the backyard, the exact same one that uh, Tafik is dealing with. So it was quite challenging. Your staff rejected um, two sets of plans and I came in here on a whim one um, day, even though much. I didn't I'm, have anything. I'm sorry, the two minutes are up. You, are you on your last point? Uh, I just have a couple more. Is that okay? Oh, well, we probably better. I thank you. I think we got the, your, your Can point. I get to the last paragraph? Uh, I'm sorry. We, we, I appreciate it. Sorry about that. Uh, One thing I'd like to add is that you let us, you guys designed it for us. You let us make it okay. taller and wider. So I think they should too. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak regarding this project? 
Okay, seeing none, close public hearing. Discussion? I don't remember what last month, I mean, I remember this this case last month, but I don't remember the exact um, changes or anything, but I do remember last month having the initial reaction of, this is out of scale, this is far too big, you know, it's taller and wider, you know, completely, completely not for it. And I mean, honestly, I don't quite have that same reaction this month. I mean, I do understand that's still staff recommendation and that it is still taller and wider, but I think, um, you know, again, last month, it doesn't matter, but, um, I think they've, you know, Van, and then I think the applicant and Van for, for working with the staff and, you know, using our comments. And, um, you know, it's come to a place that with the, the sewer easement, and I know it's still, you know, it's not quote unquote a hardship because you could just build a smaller house, but for what they want um, on this particular lot, it does sit back further. The immediate context is another house that we approved that is also larger and wider. Um, I just, um, Personally, um, I like the new design, and again, I do think it'll make this lot uh, look better overall than it has in a while. I definitely do apologize, uh, applicant, for, you can tell there was a lot of work that was put in to, to make it um, uh, more um, uh, approvable, palatable, but um, I, still, I still do have some concerns about the, you know, the parts that are out of it. Um, I do realize the site has some conditions, but the sites do have conditions. Let's see, I was trying to get back to that. So as I did before, maybe I can hear some kind of comments about like, it's definitely, uh, the things that it does have, the width uh, being more, does, do we feel like we have enough, let me hear any more comments about that, I guess I should say. I, I think, you know, in, in reading or looking at the guidelines for additions, um, they're, they're pretty specific in um, what's encouraged or what, what's allowed, I'll say that. Uh, and, and I think, if I recall correctly, that this lot width would permit a side addition and certainly um, not, I don't want to boil down staff's analysis and the time they spent on this to the either or argument, but certainly I, I think that's something that made was not insignificant, I guess, in their analysis that it's, even though it's 12 inches, it's both wider and, 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 um, and taller. Um, I, I think it complies on the width by allowing for a, um, you know, for a wider elevation. It appears, and I, I feel like it's dimensioned on the um, drawings, the distance back from the front where, where they pick up the additional 12 inches is, quite significant. Um, uh, in other words, it, set back, it sets back from the street far enough. a long way. So I, whether it's far enough or, or, or both should be allowed, I'm open for other opinions or, or, um, or further discussion. But I think it certainly does. You know, it, it, uh, the house is, um, the applicant's van is, is paid close attention to, um, to, uh, to, 2B2A, where it's sort of, you know, the, the house is preserved on the front and side additions kind of as as is and, and maintains its, uh, you, you can tell by looking at it that it this is what the house was, albeit it's a very significant addition to the back. Do you have any um, feedback maybe on the height at all or? I do appreciate the changes and improvements that have happened since the last submission, uh, especially uh, moving the the right side that that addition back so far on the lot. 
um, having gone past this lot and looked at it, you know, I, I don't think it will appear, uh, although massive, it won't be as large as the house adjacent to it that we did approve. Um, it, it is a unique situation with this lot with, uh, you know, and although it is a deep lot, as was mentioned, the front of the house really sets that setback. So the addition has to happen between where the front of the house is and where the, where the sewer easement is. So it does give some restriction from that standpoint. Any other comments or you guys can let this half I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, anyone like to um, craft a motion or any more discussion about some of the any of the other concerns of the staff? I think they actually may have you guys talked about it, but Heights on the roof. No, we've got him on. I think based on the discussion that I've heard among the commissioners here and, uh, and and what we've heard from the applicant and the staff that I move for approval uh, both of the uh, of the house and of the outbuilding. Just because, oh, yeah, let, me, let me have a motion. Do I have a second? Um, because we're going against staff recommendation, um, just do you mind being clear on the, um, I think we can do this discussion just on the specific things that you feel like it does, it does meet? Sure. Uh, I will say that although the scale is uh, much larger than uh, the existing neighborhood, that it's compatible with some other projects that we have approved. It is constrained because of the location of the front of the house and the setback and the sewer easement that transverses the site. I think that the uh, location of both the side addition and the roof raise uh, much further back on the site will make them not very visible from the front of the house. And I think the design as presented uh, preserves the front of the house and the appearance uh, that faces the street. Does that meet everything you need, Robin? It might be helpful to have some of our typical conditions, maybe not with this applicant because he knows all this, but um, final approval of windows, doors, roof color, um, location of HVAC maybe. Sorry? And approval in the masonry. Absolutely. Can that? Can Absolutely, we, yeah. yeah. Can we, yeah, okay. Instead of him restating that, can you say the typical as, as stated by staff? So second the amended motion. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just call for one vote though, if that's, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. 1211, yeah, we have one that didn't approve. 1211 7th Avenue North. 1211 7th Avenue North is an application to construct infill on a vacant lot in Germantown. Here's the site plan. The two lots on either side of, 20, of 1211 7th Avenue North are vacant. Uh, the nearest historic houses are 1207 and 1215, which are both two lots to the north and south, respectively. Um, 1207 7th Avenue North sits approximately three to four feet from the property line, so it's pretty close to that front property line. Tw uh, 1215, which is to the north, sits about 12 feet from the front property line. The applicant here is proposing to situate the infill so that it's two-story front bay. You can kind of see that at the front. Um, will be about 11 feet, six inches from the front property line. And the main wall of the house will be uh, 15 feet from the front front property line. Staff finds that the proposed front setbacks um, are appropriate given the context, but because they weren't included on the site plan and we had to guesstimate those from Metro Maps, uh, we will want to um, approve the front setback when it's staked and also we'll want to see a, a site plan that includes um, those front setbacks with uh, more accurate measurements than what we have. Uh, other than that, the base, uh, the infill meets all base zoning setbacks. 
The proposed infill will be two stories. Staff finds that a two-story form to be appropriate as the historic house formerly on the slot was two stories. That was demolished sometime before the 19, late 1970s. Um, and also there are several two-story houses across the street. The proposed infill has a maximum height of 35 feet above the foundation line and 37 feet above grade, so there is a two-foot foundation. The design guidelines limit the, new, the height of new single-family infills to 35 feet. The commission has interpreted this guideline to be to limit the height to 35 feet from grade, so it doesn't explicitly say that in the design guidelines, but that's how it's been interpreted in the past. So staff therefore recommends that the height of the infill be reduced by two feet so that there's no more than 35 feet from grade. The proposed infill will have a width of 37 feet, which is appropriate. The primary cladding material will be brick, and staff finds that all the known materials meet the design guidelines and have been approved before in the district. The front porch, you can see, is flat roofed, and it contains a railing for a deck. That railing is uncovered, and because of that, staff finds it to be appropriate and to meet the design guidelines. Uh, the dormer on the um, left elevation will contain an open balcony rather than walls uh, in a window. Uh, staff has found, or I'm sorry, the commission in the past have found dormer balconies to be appropriate when the dormers have been appropriately scaled. In addition, um, staff finds this dormer to be appropriate because it is um, not on the front facade, so it'll be um, less visible from the street, although it will be visible from the street, but it won't be as prominent because it's on the side facade. Here are the two side facades. Um, the double window openings are not drawn to have four to six um, inch mullions in between them, so we'll ask that under construction that they have four to six inch mullions um, in between the double and impaired windows. And here are some context photos. So the two photos at the top are the nearest uh, historic houses. Again, these are two lots away from the lot in question. Um, and the houses on the bottom are the two story houses that are across the street um, on this block of 7th Avenue North. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with the conditions that the front setback, um, staff approve the front setback when it's staked, the finished floor height be consistent with the finished floor height of adjacent houses, uh, the infill be lowered in height so there's no taller than 35 feet from grade, the paired window openings have four to six inch mullions, uh, staff approve the windows, doors, a brick sample, roof shingle, uh, color and texture, um, the material and design of the front porch railing and the Juliet balconies on the sides. Uh, staff approve the materials of the front walkway, porch floor, and porch steps. Staff approve the HVOC location. And finally, since this is a preservation overlay where we do review all permanent landscape features, we want to make sure that we um, review and approve all permanent landscape features, including fences, walls, pavers, walkways, etc. So with that, staff finds that the project meets the Germantown design guidelines. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Any questions from Melissa? Quick one, Melissa, yeah. on the height, um, if we look, since it's not on the drawings, would that be to the peak of the roof or is that measured to? It's measured from the grade to the very tippy top peak of the roof. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, if the applicant would like to come forward and state your name and address. I'm Michael Emmerich. Where do I live? Uh, 1237 Sixth Avenue North. I have to get used to a new address since I moved four doors. Um, I represent uh, Brent DePriest, the client on this house. We're doing something unusual for Germantown, a new single family house. <laughs> Needless to say, the neighborhood's relieved. The, uh, we agree completely with the staff recommendations, but what we would like to discuss is item three, the 35-foot height. I thought we were gonna be following the um, design guideline approval and whatever, and regardless, I'm gonna refer to those. But, uh, can you pass these? Um, basically, in developing the design of this, we have 10 foot first floor, nine foot second floor, <clears throat> approximately two and a half feet to finish floor above grade, and um, a roof slope of 12.8. This has resulted in a 37 foot basic maximum height to the ridge line for the hipped roof. Uh, the new design guidelines do say approximately 35 feet. Yeah. There's that little funny symbol in there. And based on the fact that we're trying to 
maintain the foundation ratio were within the range of appropriate above grade and we're at the low end of the roof slope. If we take two feet out, we either lose one end or the other and, and not meeting guidelines. The handout I have s sent around, uh, the elevation shows what portion of the roof exceeds two f the two feet, <laughs> the little red line. On the opposite side of the page, there are a number of residences that are circled with their existing heights. This block is unusual in the neighborhood because it has the most surviving two-story houses and they're generally tall. Um, of the two-story houses ranging from 34 to 42 feet in height. So we're looking for a little discretion in terms of working between the, the various design guidelines that have gotten us to this 37-foot height to uh, basically get permission to do the 37-foot height. Okay, any questions for Michael, okay. so just the, the height is the only thing you're? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, but anything else? Would the owner like to say anything or you're just, okay. No, All, right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, open public hearing, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, seeing none, closed public hearing. Discussion, and I think we can just focus pretty much on just the height. Yeah, I, I didn't realize the applicant would be making this presentation, but I, I was curious in, um, this is the hipped roof form and the protrusion above the 35 feet is, you know, again, is, is, is back. I, as you start taking a hip and kind of doing this with it, it they get a little wonky um, sometimes. So I, I don't find this to be egregiously out of, you know, improperly scaled or, or it's not as if an applicant is doing a front wall that's like 36 at the parapet and they need, need it to squeeze in an extra third floor or a rooftop deck or something like that. So I, I think in this case, um, my, I don't find this contrasting greatly, especially with the examples of adjacent homes that are, that are more than 35. Yeah, I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to agree. I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with Michael's work and and how um, how much he tries to, to to he loves that neighborhood. He lives in this neighborhood, and, and there's and with the other properties surrounding this house being of varying heights, I, I don't have a problem with the extra scale. Um. Move approval with the staff's recommendation, um, accepting item number three, that um, the application be uh, approved as, as presented with respect to height. Second. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have, can we have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Good seeing you, Michael. All right, um, 910 Waltrich. Is that it, Waltrich? I think so. 910 Waldkirch is an application for construction of a new residence and outbuilding. The non-contributing building seen here has been approved administratively for demolition. Uh, similar to a couple cases ago is a uh, water easement uh, running diagonally through the front yard, uh, which uh, restricts the buildable area. The new home is proposed at a story and a half with a ridge height of 27 feet, 10 inches from grade and a width 29 feet, six inches. Staff finds the proposed building to meet the design guidelines for height and scale, roof form, orientation, materials, and proportion and rhythm of openings. There are a few materials uh, which staff would recommend having final approval. The new building, I'm going to go back to the site plan, uh, meets the base zoning setbacks. However, the front setback uh, doesn't line up with the nearest contributing building um, uh, as is normally required due to the, uh, the restriction of that, um, that easement running through there. You actually can't build any closer to the front property line. Uh, therefore, staff finds the, um, the front setback appropriate here. The 
proposed outbuildings seen here is one and a half stories with a footprint of 576 square feet and a height, uh, ridge height 21 feet. It will have the same materials proposed for the residents. Staff finds that the outbuilding uh, meets section 3H of the design guidelines for outbuildings. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of this application with the conditions that the finished floor height is consistent with those of adjacent historic houses to be verified by staff, that staff have final approval of the masonry, windows and doors, uh, porch posts and railing and the roof color, um, and the, uh, the location of the HVAC was not noted uh, and that that is located behind the house or on a side facade beyond the midpoint as well. Meeting those conditions, the application meets section three for new construction in the Waverly Belmont neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Paul? Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, is the applicant here, would they like to? Okay. Do I think you have good. any comments or you're? Oh, no, okay, so for the record, the applicant agrees with all the recommendations. Clo um, open public hearing, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Seeing none, close public hearing. Do we have a motion or a discussion? I'll no, move, move approval, um, I guess with, with applause for an appropriately scaled house and, and um, finding also that the setback, all, you know, given the um, easement that runs through and the effort uh, to push the front porch to, you know, sort of meet the existing setback, you know, well, well done and, and finding that it meets all the appropriate guidelines for Waverly Belmont uh, move approval staff okay. recommendation. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, 519 Ackland Park Drive. Uh, all right, 519 Ackland Park Drive uh, is an application to construct a new duplex on a vacant lot. The house you see there has been demolished uh, as approved by staff, it was non-contributing. Uh, the duplex, well, before I get into the design, uh, a little bit more of the context. This, these two lots are to the immediate left and next of the, uh, of the lot at 519. These buildings are duplexes that were approved by this commission um, four or five years ago. Uh, there's not a whole lot of historic context on this street, but uh, the surrounding area is one and a half story historic houses, and uh, that's why these were pr approved at that scale. The proposed new duplex on this lot is also a one and a half story house. Uh, it is to be 29 feet tall, including roughly two foot of exposed foundation. Uh, it'll be 36 feet wide with a full width porch and a pair of front gable dormers. Um, uh, I guess I'll stick there. The, uh, the materials um, are typical of uh, new construction. We approve a cement fiber siding, so split faced block foundation, asphalt shingle roof, uh, a metal roof on the front porch. Um, the elevation show brick columns on the porch with wooden posts above uh, and a brick porch floor. Uh, brick is typical of porch columns, but not porch floor. Staff recommends that that be another material uh, which typically might be concrete. Uh, the form, as I think I said, are side gabled, um, one and a half story. Uh, there is a rear wing on, e on the building that is uh, functionally two stories, but the side walls are stepped in uh, to help break up and reduce the massing, keeping it in a uh, essentially one and a half story form. Uh, and that's how you would, would see it from the rear. Uh, the application also includes an outbuilding. It will be one story with an eave height of nine feet, total height of 15 feet. Um, the scale uh, would be appropriate. However, it's proposed at 777 square feet, whereas the guidelines allow up to a maximum of 750 square feet. So staff would ask that that, or recommend that that be reduced. 
And to sum up, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill and outbuilding at 519 Ackland Park Drive with the conditions that the porch floor shall be concrete or another typical material. And the brick selections for the columns are approved administratively. The windows, doors, and roofing selections are approved administratively. That the material of walkways and driveways are approved administratively. Uh, I didn't mention, but also the front stairs flare out. Um, so staff would recommend that the front stairs do not flare out uh, towards the bottom and that the outbuilding shall be reduced to be no greater than 750 square feet. With those conditions, staff finds that the project would be compatible with surrounding historic houses and meet the guidelines for the Richland West End Edition Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, any questions for Sean? Sean, on the cantilevered um, the bracketed fireplace bumps, um, do, have we had a lot of, I don't remember a previous discussion about those, maybe not in this forum, or maybe um, I, do, I don't know that. What's the, what's the staff's with, past evaluation with of those? With true chimneys, we do typically require that there be a foundation that extends to ground. Mm -hmm. um, and foundation or uh, chimneys that, that project are not factored into setbacks. They don't, or they don't count against setback encroachments or as setback encroachments. Uh, we've not always required that of like these ventless pop-out fireplaces, um, but they do need to have some perception of, you know, carrying the weight. So, so brackets have, have been approved to do that before, but if, you know, the I don't, commission yeah, could ask. I don't know if there's a better work. solution. I just, uh, in this one, looking at the proportion of how you have cap it and that that's below the rim board or, you know, between first and second. I don't know that it would necessarily be better if you made it bigger. It, you know, it, it sort of announces itself. The bigger you make it, the, it, the more important it becomes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, that's that's not a, an objection necessarily to how it's presented. I, I just wanted to see if the staff had given any previous thought or if, if we sort of had an interpretation around the best way to go about that. It was, is consistent with other Feature, similar features that have been approved. But if and the commission wanted a more substantial foundation, that's... I also asked just because it, it's so far front to the house. Uh, um, it, it certainly very, very near the front and or normally wouldn't wouldn't even maybe ri rise to the level. Of, <laughs> thanks for your comments. Okay. Thank you. Would the applicant like the, to... Yeah. Same applicant as last case. Same as before. Okay. So for the record, the applicant uh, agrees with staff recommendations. Um, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Seeing none, close public hearing. Do we have a m motion or discussion? Mr. Chairman, with respect to 519 Ackland Park Drive, I move for approval uh, with the conditions in the staff recommendation. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, okay, on to other business, building and signage elimination. You may remember this, it's something we've been talking about for a while. And this is in regards to a policy that would likely affect Broadway, 2nd Avenue, and the downtown, the three downtown overlays. The design guidelines are not very specific about some of the issues relating to building and signage illumination. Additional guidance can be given via italicized information in all those guidelines. So staff recommends a policy that's outlined in your report regarding building lighting that could be incorporated as italicized information. And I'm not gonna try to cover every line of that here, unless you'd like to, uh, but there are a few things that are worth highlighting. The first guideline is that lighting must be concealed and unobtrusive, so that's the guideline that exists. We recommend a policy that specifies that colored lighting or lighting fixtures that spin or move are not appropriate. Staff could not find any other commissions that allow for colored lighting, colored building lighting, in historic districts. Of course, there are some historic landmark buildings that have it, but those are typically very large buildings on large lots, and here you have very narrow buildings all close to each other. If all of them are allowed to have that different color, then we thought that the lighting would no longer be unobtrusive, 
which is what the design guidelines call for. In addition, staff is concerned that such a design guideline would not meet the Secretary of Interior standards, which of course they are required to do by state law. Color building illumination has the potential to change the look of or obscure architectural features, which doesn't meet standard five and nine. This policy would clarify that lighting on top of a rooftop addition is also not appropriate. The rooftop additions are supposed to be as invisible as possible, allowing for more lighting than just the low lighting needed for the tables and chairs and the entryway would really not meet the Secretary of Interior standards. So before I move on to signage lighting, which is somewhat connected and somewhat disconnected, are there any questions about the building illumination? Okay. Uh, these first two changes to signage can also be added as italicized information, because uh, again, they're just providing further guidance. They're not changing the existing guidelines. The information about the color of the fixture and temporary lighting has always been our, our policy, just not memorialized in the design guidelines. For instance, we have never reviewed holiday lighting. Christmas lighting has likely been up a little more than 30 days, but we've never really enforced that. You've allowed for chasing lights as a modification, so this italicized point is to provide some parameters. Sorry, I forgot I have them up here. Um, some parameters is when they are appropriate. As you may remember, we've also had several discussions about bare bulbs. However, the design guidelines um, list them specifically as a type of lighting that is not allowed. So it's something that we can talk about today as to whether or not you want to allow them in the future, but that's not something that can be added as italicized because that would be changing the existing design guidelines. But we are working on revisions for Broadway, for at least Broadway. So that's something that could be incorporated there. We just need your feedback. Any questions? Is that everything or so you? That, that's just the highlights of everything that's in your report. Okay. And are you looking for us to discuss this now as far as it? Yes, I think there's public comment and then discussion, yes. Okay. A and a vote. Okay, thanks. thanks. Any questions for to Robin before we open public hearing? Okay, open public hearing. Would the people like to come speak regarding this? Just come and state your name and address. I'm uh, with the uh, Tennessee Historical Commission, and I uh, live here in Nashville, uh, 171 Antioch Pike, um, down in the uh, Glencliff area. Um, I had, and I have a few points that I wanted to, 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 to mention, but I, um, like I say, currently am the Historic Sites Director for the, the State of Tennessee, and previous to that at the Tennessee Historical Commission, I've served five years as a local zoning coordinator for the State of Tennessee, and, and in that capacity for about five years, I worked with approximately 50 communities across Tennessee, helping establish historic zoning and helping them with enforcement decisions, et cetera, uh, for, for those years. I've also served previously uh, before I came here, which is right after Katrina. I was the deputy director of the Vu Carre Commission in New Orleans uh, in, 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 in charge of the French Quarter and, of course, all the enforcement there of, of that zoning. I've also been the executive director with the Tennessee Preservation Trust here in uh, uh, Tennessee, and I uh, have just had uh, been fortunate enough to have a lot of interface with communities, and particularly with something like the French Quarter, which in, in many ways uh, some of their uh, uh, intense commercial areas down there are very similar to that. In many years ago, I was one of the people involved with helping initiate particularly studies on lighting down there and in addressing it that has resulted, that has grown since I left, and has resulted in, in a very comprehensive approach towards lighting, particularly in business communities down there, et cetera. And I guess I wanted to come here today to encourage you to support the uh, staff's position on this. Uh, you know, for us, historic districts are about authenticity from, from my perspective, and I think from the commission's perspective, it's about authenticity, and that when you when you do something this severe with lighting, in other words, every district deals with holiday lighting, every di district deals with specialty lighting for special events. It's sort of like banners. 
you know, if you put a banner up, it's for an event. You know, there, people are always pushing the edges at times, but you know, the banner's there for the special event. If you end up leaving the banner up all the time, it's no longer a banner. Although it was a banner, you know, it, it, it's a sign now. Same thing with lighting. People that want to put up holiday lighting and leave that for forever, that is no longer holiday lighting. It's not special event, it's become. If you want to take buildings and and wash them, special events, you know, et cetera, that's one thing. But if you want to take buildings and wash them with not inauthentic colors, that, that, that essentially you're creating a character defining element to the building. And, and as such, you're changing the authenticity of that structure in that environment. And, and by doing that, you, you, you no longer, uh, you know, create an authentic historic environment. It's inauthentic. And it no longer represents, you know, the, 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 the character and the character defining elements of that historic district. And that's at the real core of these sort of things. It, it is controversial. At the, at the same time, I think Robin mentioned this too. I, I'm not aware of any districts in the United States. I was privileged to be part of a public discussion, I think a few months ago, about this, and I spoke at that event as well. And I, I think, I know for the people that, that were there trying to support your staff's position and, and help explain what our perspectives are on this, you know, we brought in people and consultants that have worked all around the nation that have done hundreds and hundreds of, of design guidelines for historic districts. Uh, uh, Phil Thomason was, was one of those people. And, you know, they, again, could not point to, you know, what we saw consistently is this is, is not allowed in, in these districts. The other thing I didn't see is anyone presenting districts where specifically this type of approach is allowed or support is allowed or supported or promoted for a way to authentically represent uh, historic districts or uh, of course economic issues were brought up is is that this was necessary for the economic development of districts and and again we feel strongly about that that historic authenticity is at the very core of what makes these areas work what makes them really interesting to people is, is because that unique authenticity, uh, historic authenticity, it just resonates. It, it resonates with people on a visceral level, on a psychological level. There's something very profound about it. And when you degrade it and, and when you intrude upon it and you go past a certain point, it, it becomes, you know, almost burlesque. It loses, it loses that, that authenticity. It loses that resonance that, that it just naturally has, I think, with the public uh, and, and with people in general. And we see district, you know, you know, Charleston, New Orleans, and look at Broadway, you know, what's happening here. And I think there's always those pressures from businesses and I think from, from uh, economic interests that feel that they have to promote this. We see this with all your big box retailers. We've seen it with all of your fast food places that will insist we have to have these iconic images. And time after time in these historic districts, what, what has been enforced, what's been done, is that is all scaled down and represented within the framework of, of normal signage, and it works. Those are often some of the most success, ice cream places. They'll have a very standard, when they go to malls or strip malls or whatever, very standard kind of iconic front and say, we have to have this. But those stores, when they do alter and adapt to the authentic environments, those stores are almost always some of the most successful in these, in these chains around the nation. There's been extensive economic research done on historic preservation and on these guidelines and the enforcement of them. Um, a firm in D.C., I'm, I'm, I'm sorry the name escapes me right now, but it's been a landmark studies for the last three decades on this. And, and there is no, there, to my knowledge, and I've looked for this and challenged the public for, for years about this, there is no uh, a, a credible study that's ever been shown that shows that, his, that the enforcement of, of preservation standards in historic districts has a negative of economic effect. Every legitimate study that I've been aware of in the hundreds of them and for the last 30 or more years shows that the imposition of these standards always has a positive effect to varying degrees, but that it's, it, it never has a, you know, what, what creates value is specialness. And we see it also in our neighborhoods. We see it with, with our residential areas. What creates value is specialness, restrictions. Sometimes people feel that, that it is onerous. Sometimes the edges do need to be adjusted on it, but that 
we find, particularly for these historic areas, that these types of, of controls that have been well-defined, worked out over the last 75 years with the Secretary of Interior Standards and through uh, best practices with historic districts, this, is, this has resulted in, in a standardized approach to this that we find is very economically powerful and very well supported as best practices for historic districts. And again, we just, I feel strongly and we feel strong that is that the staff's position on this is very legitimate, uh, very professionally based, and we would strongly uh, encourage you to please support that uh, with your staff and simply support that as part of your design guidelines uh, here for your districts. And I, I, again, I just think that, that it's very profoundly supported by all the economic studies done and by best practices uh, across the nation. And I think you've got a, you know, we've got a great resource here is being developed in, in great ways. It's got a lot of pressure and I think you guys have a lot of responsibility and I'm sure you get a lot of criticism for, you know, for your hurting this and hurting that, but I think what you're, what, what, what at the heart of it, of course, is what we're all trying to do is protect it so that it does keep this unique value and does make this great economic, it's all about economic, it yeah. does make this great economic contribution to our community. But At the same time, it's such an important cultural element that's irreplaceable. So I think if that thank helps you very, uh, in any way, I'd be happy to answer questions yeah. about my background or any of the, any of the perspectives. Well, I think but, the, the history was good for all of us. Um, okay. So I, I allowed you to go a little Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm sorry to impose on, no, on no, your okay. time, the public's time. I, I apologize for that. Oh, you're good. You're good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, would anyone else like to come forward? Trey, for, just for the note the Historic Nashville is approving. Sure. I'm Trey Bruce. I'm a Vice Chair of Historic Nashville, and um, we, we, we had some reservations and concerns, but all that's been alleviated, and we agree with the uh, draft policy that the commission's taken regarding um, building and signage elimination. Thanks. You bet. Okay, if there's no other, close public hearing. Um, discussion? I know that she, you, Robin wanted to hear a little bit, maybe our thoughts on the LED bulbs and, yeah. yeah and I'm, I'm in, Great support of the uh, draft policy. I would uh, would urge the, the staff, though, as we move forward with looking at the bare bulbs and the LED, since that does come up so regularly, that we go ahead and address that. And I think the draft language is a good start. But in addition to the shape of the bulb, I do think it's important for us to address the uh, color temperature that those bulbs emit as well. So, I know we can say white, but sometimes. That color it looks more like blue than white to me. So, so I think I think that's an important consideration to have in, in the language. Yeah, I agree with the the way it's actually, you know, um, five is written right now because I I do like the. I think this is good. Can we talk? I don't know about how. I guess there'll be just more discussion about that color part of it because we'll, we can, we will get more into that. But is there a? Um, I mean, and you don't have to know the answer, but maybe there is a scientific color, you know, that or a technical color that we can make sure that lighting people can help us get up with. Oh, oh sure, there, there, there isn't, and the language actually suggested in that it talks yeah. about appearing as an incandescent. But maybe there's a an incandescent has a color range yeah. that's that's uh, that, that is maybe that's what we put in there specific to color. The, the policy specifies daylight, a white daylight color, and we did see this as not a draft, but as a final document for you to vote on today. But if you don't think it's ready, of course. We can oh. put it off again. Well, we were going to vote. I just know you want to specific. Make sure we talked about that. Well, I'm I'm going to call for a vote anyway. But, but but one point of clarification though, if I heard you correctly beforehand, you said that we were adopting the italicized language, and that since the LED bulbs weren't part of the italicized language, that we wouldn't be acting on those today, but that would be further studied. Is that that, that's correct? correct, everything but the bare bulbs. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about lighting in general. No, just the bare no, bulbs. Just, yeah, just and the I, bulbs. I think, yeah, the, the comment about temperature perhaps being added or further specified in, in what's numbered as five in the presentation would uh, is, is what we're, what the discussion has been about. Yeah, So that too. would be 
forthcoming in the guideline changes. Right. Okay, so we've kind of discussed that. Was there any other item that you wanted us to discuss? I think it was just that one, right? I, I would love for you to discuss any part of it that you want to. Well, there were a lot of workshops and a lot of, you know, we've gone through a lot. But is there any other comments from it? Or it seems like we got where we were going, but. Um, sure, I, you know, I think with the public meetings, with the discussions that we've had with the expert uh, witnesses, with Historic Nashville, with Mr. Brown's testimony, uh, I'm prepared and, and eager to go ahead and make a motion that we adopt this uh, revised language. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, is there something about commissioner training? Well, I'll ask you. It's been a long day. Do you want to do that today, or should we put it off for Let's, another time? I think it would be good to put it off, maybe when we know that the agenda might be a little shorter. Um, I would, uh, you know, maybe we can... Maybe we can. Yeah, yeah. It? maybe we can do it. Um, and we, as we always do, part of our uh, initiation for new members is to make it the long meeting. But uh, <laughs> I, I do want to thank Ladonna Boyd and Eric Brown for agreeing to serve on the commission and um, welcome you two today. And look forward to a shorter meeting. No, I appreciate you guys and appreciate your service. Can I ask one other quick question before we adjourn? Um, every month we send you a l email, excuse me, <coughs> just checking in to see whether or not you're able to attend. Would an Outlook request be better, easier, doesn't make any difference? Any thoughts? I'm hearing yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Outlook. So maybe an even Outlook request as opposed to an email? I have no opinion. Yeah, even that Google thing would be good. You know, the, the survey, that Google survey. Oh, but since you're asking for a specific time, I think, I mean, it's a set meeting, so I think yeah. either one's fine, but the Outlook's pretty easy to click on in the okay. calendar. That's true. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, meeting adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.